This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of February, Mountain Glass is offering shot tube and rod at 40% off. Just put in the code SHOT, that is S-C-H-O-T-T at checkout. And for all you soft glass nerds, they are offering their COE 104 sale. Creation is messy, 30% off. Just put in the code MESSY, that is M-E-S-S-Y at checkout. And for any other questions and all your glass needs, just go to mountainglass.com. That is mountainglass.com. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 86. This is Jay Michael, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in today with 17 years of experience behind the torch. I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories and hopes to inspire and entertain while helping you grow your business. It's an honor to do this show on a weekly basis. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Today is a special episode featuring Micah Evans. Uh, Micah has graced us with his presence by taking some time out of his busy schedule to come on and share his story with you guys. Uh, His background, where he came from, where he started, his uh, time at Penland, all kind of stuff. We had a pretty fun conversation. I actually just got off the phone with him, so I'm a little bit pumped up right now, if you can't tell. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, he not only has been doing glass since 99, uh, like myself, which is awesome, uh, but he has been very instrumental in uh, the industry of functional art and the pipe itself. And his passion uh, shines through in this episode about how happy and how much he loves the pipe and the function of it and the ceremonial aspect of it. I hope you guys enjoy. It. Again, this interview with Micah was phenomenal. Uh, it's a little bit over two hours long, and I am worn the hell out. So <laughs> I'm going to let you all go before I start rambling. But in the meantime, please share this with your friends and family. Those of you out there who are glass artists that want to share what it is that you do, uh, definitely share the show with them. Uh, if you're just a collector or a, a person who appreciates glass in general, uh, share this with your other friends who are collectors and appreciate this as well if they haven't heard it. And then also, please don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes. Uh, If you have a Droid and you listen to it on the Droid systems, you can go to Stitcher and listen to it there as well. And then also go to wiseguyradio.com. And at the bottom of the page there, you can subscribe. The website has not been updated for several months, but it is up and active. And I am now uh, finally have got everything taken care of on my end to get this new website up and going, which I'm pumped about. It's going to be time-consuming, but it is worth it all. So that being said... I'm getting the hell out of here. You all enjoy this episode with Micah Evans. And again, I love you all so much. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you to Green Flash Glass and Mountain Glass for being on board as our main sponsors. Uh, definitely go to check those guys out. Uh, their links are in the show notes. And if you have any questions or comments, you can li- hit the comment link in the show notes as well. And just send me an email and let me know what's up. Other than that, you all take it easy. Happy melting. And we will talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Take it easy. Peace. What's going on, Micah? How you doing, brother? Good, good, man. So excited to uh, to be on this, and I'm I'm honored. Thank you so much. Hey, man, the honor is all mine too, brother. So uh, I know you're busy and getting back into Texas now, getting settled in, getting some new studio space going with all the boys at San Elmo's. So. Sounds yeah. like a lot of fun, and you got a huge crew of awesome artists and influential guys there. So it's uh, definitely hats off to you for oh for being a part yeah, of that I, and influencing. I got lucky. Us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, while I was gone at this at Penland for three years, they they built this um, crazy awesome studio, and I was lucky enough to move back in and have have them have everything set up for me pretty much. So yeah. I lucked out big time. It's yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So before we get too far off track, if you want to go ahead and get us started by giving us a little bit of your background, uh, you know, art background yeah. for schooling and what have you, and then uh, what got you into the glass and who introduced you to it. Sure. Um, so, yeah, let's see. I, uh, you know, I grew up in Washington State, you know, um, and uh, 
in a rural town in central Washington. Um, and uh, as far as the early art education, I was in an agricultural town, so we had like one art class, you know, and um, um, I'd always kind of done art on my own. Um, uh, in the in the long run, I ended up leaving that little town to move to Seattle, and I, I enrolled in the Art Institute of Seattle, um, which is kind of a trade school for artists. I never was a great student, so I couldn't really get into a, a real college, is what a quote-unquote real college. Um, but I was going, this was the late 90s, you know, so 96 or so, so uh, I was going to be a computer animator, man. I wanted to make video games. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. <laughs> You know, I thought I did. Uh, back then, it was a little different. Like trying to get what's in your head onto the computer was a bit more of a more closer to programming than any anything artistic, as far as I I felt. So I really didn't last too long. I think I made it about a year and a half in that program before I ended up just kind of dropping out, um, and then kind of stumbled into a glass studio, which my my roommate at the time was a glass blower. Um, and a uh, flame worker, pipe maker. And uh, he worked at a studio in Stone, let's see, Stoneway Glass in uh, kind of the Fremont area of Seattle. And uh, I uh, just hung out at that studio until I got an opportunity to jump on the torch. Um, so it's funny, I don't really have a ton of education, which um, has been. Uh, interesting my whole career because I put myself into positions that normally you'd kind of need a degree to get to um, I always like to say I kind of snuck around the back door um, and climbed in the window to a lot of these opportunities um, but uh, but yeah I got the one year I did spend at the Art Institute of Seattle I got a really good foundation in like kind of like just basic design principles and color theory and you kind of your core art education education quote unquote you know yeah yeah it's good, um, good more foundation. of kind of from a like a yeah like an illustration or or like um more of a uh uh uh, uh let's see i don't know how, what you'd really call it i guess more of a practical um art education not not much in the conceptual world mm -hmm. you know but um but yeah so that was that was a kind of my the extent of my my official art education no degree um, but, uh, a little bit of Im good information and a couple of really great instructors, which really helps. Yeah. Um, and then the rest big, was, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, how glass goes flame working it, it, before the, I mean, that's when the internet was just getting off the ground. I mean, it was there, but there wasn't a lot of content. Nobody, nobody had really early adopters of the internet weren't flame workers and didn't, hadn't really put a ton of content online at that point. So, you know, we, I took a couple of introductory classes basically. And, um, from there you're kind of left to your own on your own. So I hung out at hot shops a lot. And, uh, you know, the, uh, contemporary lamp working was your, was your Bible. That was your YouTube back then. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you just kind of pick up what you can and, um, and then make it up as you go. Do you find that, that hanging out in the hot shops really helped, I guess influence um, like hand technique or certain you know certain parts of your creativity. Yeah, there was. It's funny. There's a lot of transfer. You know, it did. It did because the material when it's hot, the material kind of moves in the same way. Mm -hmm. But when uh, you know, and when boro is in the flame, the viscosity and kind of how it moves is very similar to the, to hot glass. Um, but as soon as you take it out of the flame, everything changes. So there was a there was a bit of transfer. Um, yes, most definitely. Um, and a lot of bad habits I picked up as well, things that <laughs> didn't cross over that, you know, you don't really know at that point. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, and it, so, um, yeah, it was, and, and back then it, the studios were more closed off too. Like, um, people weren't as sharing, you weren't, you weren't able to pick up as much from other people necessarily, um, so it was it was an interesting time to be a flame worker. Uh, that's I think we were stagnant as far as like the the rate of uh, kind of progression back then was much slower. Yeah, um, man, compared to nowadays, that... holy shit. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah right? it's great now. I mean, I think it took yeah. probably most of us like ten years to really find our groove. Where now you got guys that's oh. like six to eight months a year into it, they're like doing stuff I never even thought I was going to be doing in ten years. 
Yeah, it's well, amazing. I mean, it's a it's a good and bad, you know. And, yeah, because I, I, I think I I ended up with a huge diverse skill set mm-hmm. compared to kind of um, I I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm generalizing too much, but I think that people that get into it now are able to kind of concentrate much earlier on and maybe specialize in in kind of one aspect of flame working, whereas I had to diversify so much to to figure things out on my own and just to make a living, you know, especially that too, that I ended up with a, a bit of a, my, uh, let's say my toolbox has a lot more tools in it than, than most flame workers. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the difference nowadays. between like a glass artist and a pipe maker. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, no, I, it's funny. I think it's just flame working, you know, especially for that time. Uh, I don't, it, it, there's that weird, uh, there's a weird um, line that a lot of people put between glass artists and, and pipe makers. And mm-hmm. I have a hard time defining that line at all. Um, I think especially after kind of what I've been going through in the last three years with at Pinland and things like um, that line has pretty much disappeared altogether. You yeah. know, for me, I think it's just a, it's just a, yeah, it's cultural. It's like the difference between hip hop and classical music. It's like, they're both music. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah well do you but, find um, it like early on because i know if like for me it was the same it was this way but early on in your in your glass career but if you mentioned that you were a, a a glass artist or a lamp worker or flame worker to someone that was a furnace worker even did they immediately give you the stigma like oh you must make pipes like they didn't want to even discuss anything with you because they just assumed that you made pipes at the time um yeah well yeah so i i uh yeah, having that that uh, that uh, um, that line of pipe making, you know, back in the '90s in Seattle and Northwest, it was it wasn't exactly like it is now, but I'd say it was kind of similar, like where it was it was it was a it was um, almost pop culture then too, like it was um, pretty popular, like it wasn't necessarily looked down upon okay. um, in the '90s in the Northwest. But when I moved to Florida, which was um, a couple years after I started. Um, yeah, I moved to the Bible Belt to a place without a a pipe culture or even a marijuana culture. Mm-hmm. Um, that 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 line started to get more defined, right? Where people, whether it was the hot glass people or um, uh, just pe- people in general, you know, were were had way, were way more closed off to the pipe stuff, right? Yeah, that's how I've always um, dealt with here in Florida for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, fuck, Florida. Yeah. So back in the 90s in Florida, it was like, I mean, so much different. I mean, the, the shops in my neck of the woods would get raided by the DEA even pretty much yearly, mm-hmm. you know. And so and then the more more Bible Belt, more conservative. Um, so people didn't necessarily look look at you um, in, a, in a good light at all, you know. So there was a huge contrast between the Northwest and anywhere else in the country pretty much back then. As far as uh, how people looked at you as a, as a pipe maker, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that that defining line between the hot glass, let's say, and pipes wasn't necessarily between hot glass and pipes. That that tension was between hot glass and flame working. There's always been a bit of a uh, uh, you know uh, big brother little brother kind of uh, resentment almost or like you know what i mean mm-hmm. like we're, yeah, we're, sure. we're related but you know you know your mom and dad are much easier on you or like you know it's like this you know it's not like disrespectful but they just definitely don't respect you you know <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> it's I hard to, no, it's totally hard. I, I agree i agree yeah <laughs> and that's and that's disappearing right now i think because of that the next this new generation of the hot glass mm-hmm. of the hot shop right because they've grown up with pipes as a a, a pop culture thing you know through high school and so they're coming into their hot glass programs at universities these kids now with an understanding of what flame working is um you know a, a much broader understanding of what flame working is right yeah especially um, now too with a lot of the colleges offering more so than they used to glass classes yeah yeah and um yeah, it's 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 really great, you know, because we're seeing a lot more people crossing over. Like there's like the Danny Whites of that world, yeah, that are extremely talented in the hot hot shop, and like the the up and comers of the soft glass world, 
are so excited about the flame workers and collaborating and dabbling and going back and forth, you know, and that's um, never really happened across the board. And it's also a changing dynamic in the hot shop where there's a, a kind of a new, not new, but there's a more of a popularized sculpting techniques in the hot shop where they're working the glass colder and heating it with torches, you know? Yeah, exactly. So the hot, even the hot shop techniques have learned ha, are leaning heavier on the torch so they're basically flame working at the bench at a much larger scale with a different material so that um the just the the skills the hand skills and the the, the kind of the knowledge bases are, are aligning um just in just just naturally which is interesting yeah it's, it's it's a cool dynamic to see the evolution of it all kind of yeah like you're saying like the crossover almost kind of thing going on is pretty neat yeah. So to kind of back up a little bit, when you were still in Seattle, what were some of the first things that you were making? It was all pipes, you know. Was I mean, it? I um, I I learned, you know. I mean, that was my when I was, you know, I think I started when I was uh, 23, 24 years old, you know, and I was uh, um, I was going pro as a as a pot smoker, you know, that was my lifestyle. <laughs> right. Um, no, I could no longer compete in the Olympics. Like I had made the transition to <laughs> out of amateur and into the pros. So. Um, <laughs> Which is which is great because like, you know, that's the time where like, you know, it was that was fun. You know, I had a bunch of roommates, I had lived with like six dudes in a house, and rent was cheap, and we just kind of played hacky sack, and you know, like, <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, went, went to fish shows, and and I learned how to blow glass, and it was a really fun time in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, the pipes fit right in with kind of the dynamic of my social life. Right. And um, so it just felt uh, it felt great. You know, it was really fun. Um, and uh, like I said, it was like, you know, people it was a little bit of a little bit of a subculture pop culture thing back then. Like it was kind of cool. It was really cool to be a pipe maker. You know, not a lot of people got to do it. And you felt kind of this rebellious outlaw type thing going on. Yeah, for sure. Did, um, you, did you have a name for yourself back then, like an alias, or did you just always go by? Man, I never thought I was cool enough to have an alias, right? <laughs> and so, like, I just was worried about the glass. And, and to tell you the truth, in that first year, you're just trying to learn so much. Mm -hmm. Now you kind of pick your alias before you even fucking pick up a piece of, piece of glass, right? right? Yeah, and totally. Back, back then, um, yeah, I could never think of one that stuck, right? And then it just never really, you just kind of went by Micah. Um, and over the years, like, everybody had the weirdest names, too. At a certain point, I started calling myself kind of jokey names to uh, kind of make fun of some of the guys that had these just crazy-ass hippie, um, you know, aliases. I, for a while, I went as uh, Goat Scroat. Uh, <laughs> and uh... then it's then it actually stuck for a second. And I was like, oh, shit, now I'm fucking Goat Scroat. i got to, like, change this, right? And so I think my earliest glass pipe glasspipes.org glass art it was that and then i changed to my initials at a certain point which is just me mm -hmm. me um which actually really resonated just cuz i um it was just simple it wasn't too far of a stretch away from my you know my real name i uh i didn't i've always had a problem with um while I, while it was necessary to to create a, a distance between my name and the pipes, sometimes, especially early on, you know, in the Bible Belt stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I always felt like I, it was really kind of weird to not own what you're doing, you know. Yeah. Um, in a way that um, I, I wanted my name to be associated with it, uh, kind of, but uh, not at the same time. It's mm -hmm. really hard. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that that's weird. was just. That was the perfect distance for me, or at least that my signature on it was not my full name, but um, it wasn't too far away from who I really was. Hell yeah! So when you yeah. guys, uh, so you just, so you were working with Lance up in uh, Seattle. Yeah. So so yeah, Lance actually, Lance Sanford taught me how to blow glass, right? Nice. Um, and it's funny we look back on it, and a lot of us have this thing where we take an apprenticeship from the guy that's like really good at glass blowing. But back then in the nineties, um, um. We really, even the guys that were really, really good, uh, didn't know a ton about flame working. Um, you know, and I'm sure that'll be the same way another 15 years from now. People look back at us and be like, man, we thought they were so good back then, but they didn't really know a whole lot. That's right. Um, and so that apprenticeship was, you know, like two or three really uh, introductory, basically now introductory classes, right? 
Um, but he gave me that window into flame working and then taught me everything he knew, you know, and he'd only been blowing glass for a year and a half or two years at that point. Um, and we, we were working on Victor single tip, Victor welding torches, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it, it gave us a, gave me a window into the, into, uh, flame working. And then, uh, we, we, you know, we're making just mostly outside work, you know, wrap and rake stuff, uh, layered fume stuff, um, and then just dipped into inside out and which was as soon as I got a, a torch that was bigger than a Victor, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So Lance, Lance taught me, uh, the, the, the very beginning and he ended up being a guy that I, uh, after a year and a half or so in Seattle, we decided to move to Florida away from that winter. He had some family in Jacksonville beach or Jacksonville, Florida, um, and to start a little studio in Florida. Um, and I was all about it, you know, and just uh, it's about as far away as I could get from where I grew up, not just, you know, geographically in the United States, but culturally too. I didn't yeah. realize it at the time, but once I moved down there, I realized that, Oh my goodness, like this is way more Confederate than, uh, than I thought it would be. Um, and, uh, that was interesting. Yeah. For me. What's interesting too, for myself is I remember when you guys came to Florida and, I didn't I didn't put it together until I was going over your bio the stuff you sent me and I was like holy shit I totally remember when you guys came to Florida and then I remember when <laughs> you were, went to Georgia for a bit and then they were like you were kind of going all over the place but I remember when you guys came to Florida and I remember Lucid Visions and then uh at what point did Josh come on board Josh was actually so Josh was our best friend in Seattle okay. right um so Josh and I in Seattle um, we went to college together or the art institute together and yeah. we both dropped out about the same time um, to go pro with the weed, you know, and then uh, <laughs> and then um, uh, he was always just like itching at the bed. He's super creative, right? Super creative guy still is. He's just in, I think he's not blowing glass. At, I don't know if he's blowing glass at all, but or as much, but still doing really creative stuff. Yeah, his paintings right? are awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like phenomenal. And like work ethic is great. And um but anyway, so he uh, was always like, you could tell he was like, man, I really want to, you know, I really, if there's ever a way, you know. And so when we decided to move to Florida, he was ready to get out of there, too. And so uh, he was like, he just got married, you know, and it was him and his wife were like, let's let's get the fuck out of here, you know. Um, and so he was like, hey, if if I tag along, not tag along, but if uh, I'll move as well. And then if we kind of go three ways in on the studio, will you guys teach me how to blow glass? And we're like, yeah, that's perfect right because at the time lance in seattle we were working at somebody else's studio there wasn't really a way to bring somebody in at the time to teach them without a big to do mm -hmm. you know or even let them touch the material it was a bit of a closed off spot um which is okay we, we, i don't blame the the owner of that studio that's just the nature of how they ran that studio it's totally fine but when we realized we we're going to be in control of our own destiny we were like oh man we would love to teach our best friend how to you know what we knew um, and that's kind of how it went. So we all moved. We got a house a couple blocks from the beach in Jacksonville Beach, Let's started learning to surf, picked up some odd jobs, saved money for about a year. And we all went in on this little hole in the wall studio, again, still two blocks from the beach. Um, and uh, slowly but surely, you know, we all just kind of pulled in and uh, we split the ventilation, split the air, split everything, and and really didn't know what we were doing. You know, we're like, I guess we're just starting a studio, and then we realized, oh, I think we're starting a business. Yeah. And then we're like, I guess we're running a business, and like, you know, and so we kind of fell into this, like, uh, and learning everything as we went. You know, Josh is learning glass blowing, you know, and and then all of us together are trying to figure out how to how to make a business work, you know, without any sort of business experience right, at all, yeah. you know, and then, uh, and then maintain a friendship through all of that, which ended up, you know, the business, the old, uh, you know, business and friendship thing. Um, people, um, always recommend staying away from, we just kind of fell into a business after being friends. We really didn't decide to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, but what ended up happening, you know, is that, uh, we are still all making pipes, but there wasn't a culture, right? And there wasn't really a whole lot of places to to sell it. Um, but what we did do is we nailed down one head shop on the beach. It was a surf shop. And we could supply their whole little head shop they had in the back of the surf shop from the top to the bottom, you know, from the headies to the one-hitters. 
and that we would all split up those that thing. Um, well, that was basically our only outlet. Um, and instead of competing against each other for the only money we had, we decided we should just all three create a production line and then split the money. So um, nobody's kind of left out, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's how the business got started. And that blossomed into, you know, Operation Pipe Dreams happened about a year after we opened that studio, which was uh, kind of when they really cracked down on the paraphernalia stuff mm -hmm. under the guise of supporting terrorism, you know, and then... We didn't know what to do, so we would we were kind of like trying to figure out ways to make money that weren't pipes, you know. And that's when Lucid Visions was really took off. Was um, we started making other stuff, like mostly little sculptural ornaments and things. Um, and uh, and then a small business was born. It's funny how it happens. Yeah, it's but. interesting because I remember that point in time too. We were the same way. I had a, I had like six six guys under my wing, running a full studio of production and. We got the phone call. The feds were in Florida, over in the west or the uh, east coast, hitting hitting yeah. an import company, and we were in the middle of blowing blowing a doobie down. And it was like, holy fuck, what are we gonna do now? You know. And it was yeah. interesting after seeing degenerate art and really seeing na nationwide. I mean, everybody that I've looked up to was all going through the same shit. You know. And we were like, oh yeah, what the fuck are we gonna do now? And it's like we went yeah. under, even deeper underground, but we were making yep. shot glasses and dildos and pendants and whatever we could make to freaking make a living. You know. It was, yeah. But it, like you're saying, it, it made us, it forced us all to get out of the pipes and get into something different and learn how to sell work that wasn't pipes. That was easy to sell. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, it, well, it's so funny because, like, we never quit making pipes, you know. Yeah, yeah same with But me. I think what we did is we, like, it, we had to put a legitimate face in case somebody came and knocking. Yep. That we could be like, Oh no, we make fucking uh, dolphins and uh, you know seahorses and uh, you know mermaids and we had a couple outlets for that, but realistically, like still eighty percent of our money came from the pipes, you right. know. Um, and it's so funny when looking back on it too is like I really think that um, why I started making the art stuff to begin with was so I had something to show my parents, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I, I never told them I never told them I was a pipe maker till like 10 years in. There's a whole nother like background to that. But uh -huh. was, you know, growing up with a conservative family, you don't know, like, um, you know, and they never like, like were helping me out with money or anything or there's never any reason really not to tell them except to just like make Thanksgiving a little less awkward. So I was just like never really told them what I was making. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I agree. And then, uh, and then I realized that that art stuff uh, uh, was um, – I'd always been, I guess, uh, had that uh, desire to just create things for myself on the side. Like, I've always done that ever since I was a kid. Um, and that kind of continued. And as soon as I started blowing glass, it just started to be out of glass instead of in my sketchbook or instead of a painting or drawing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'd always had these side projects um, – from on the side and then eventually kind of those d develop some momentum you know those um uh started to get noticed and so i just kind of fell into the art stuff as well um and a lot of that really had to do with our early adoption of the internet and that's one thing that people don't really see is that what opd did drove us underground and that that kind of went hand in hand with the the acceleration of the content on the internet with glasspipes.org and glassartists.org and the ability for us to network nationally in this underground scene through these websites yeah. and basically the myspace or facebook of flame working back then was this little unknown dot org websites that um you know and then the the kind of the melting pot or blackboard back then you know yeah. um so uh, our early adoption of that stuff um, let us connect with our collecting community way before what we see now, are a lot of other art forms kind of starting to tap into that, where we're, we're old. We, we've been doing that for a while. Yeah, we're seasoned. Know? Oh, yeah. And so our little subculture is a subculture economy of, like, connecting with the, directly with the collector, you know. Yeah. It has everything to do with that go government crackdown and kind of how everything developed. Yes, um, it's, yeah, it's so, neat. yeah. Um, but I mean, a, a huge person in my career at that point, and this was in Florida, and at Lucid Visions was um, Nate Myers uh, moved to St. Augustine, um, uh, and uh, ended up uh, at one point like 
his he started a little garage studio at a, his his buddy or roommates he had a garage studio at the house he was living and he went on vacation and came back and somebody had broken in and stolen his basically his whole studio holy shit and so we had just kind of met um a couple of months earlier and he called me up and told me that and i was like you've got to be fucking kidding me and nate had come in when he first moved there to our studio and just shown us every trick in his book like for free just this is how you do everything i know how to do and he knew all kinds of stuff we didn't know so it was the first person coming from a kind of a closed studio situation in the 90s that blew that out of the water and was just like here you go it's just open let's share let's do this you know um and he was way more internet savvy than all of us and he introduced me to glass pipes and um glass artists and like all that stuff so Oh yeah. Hey dude, I hate to cut you off. Can you give me one second? I, my dogs are sharing a crate right now. Oh shit. And my uh my eight month old I just walked in there and she has t- t- completely ripped her bed apart. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, yeah, go for it, man. Give me one sec. <laughs> you got it. Alright, I thought I heard some noise in there. I'm like, I wonder what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> These are really good, but she has she's almost a year, so she's like Still puppy, but still wants to get this gets bored and then starts tearing shit up. It's annoying, and then she likes to eat the stuff too, which is not good. One of these days, it's going to cost us a lot of money for blocked intestines or some shit, you know? Right? Yeah, totally. Jesus. All right. So anyway, so uh, yeah, man. So that's awesome with Nate because uh, you know, he's he's definitely just in the community in general. He's definitely a big influence for a lot of folks and, you know, the tools he's oh, yeah. making and, you know, all the other fun stuff nowadays. So it's, that's, I had no idea he was here. I, I, he's not here anymore though, right? He's moved. No, no, he's in, he, uh, you know, is, uh, one of the founding members of, uh, the ever dream studio oh, right. okay. in Colorado that's what I thought. with okay. Joe Peters and WJC and yeah. Eugene. And, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, well, he was only there for a couple of years, you know, and, um, and then he moved out back out to the Northwest and, um, kind of took off from there, but he was a huge influence and and gave me a ton of uh, information and skill set back then. It was really great. Yeah. Hell yeah. So, at what point in time did you decide to get up and uh, head to Miami? Um, when I left that business, basically when um, Lucid Visions kind of um, not necessarily broke up because they kept going, but that we hit a point where it wasn't sustaining three people in that. Um, but it would probably sustain two, right? Mm-hmm. And it was also to a point where we needed to make, you know, pipes to survive. Um, and that, you know, they were, again, just the nature of where we were in the time of the, in the political nature of the country. Like, they were really wanting to not make as much pipes, right? Yeah. Um, and so there was a bit of a uh, me, me going like, you know, we have to do this to pay the bills and then going, we don't want to do this anymore. And so there was this a point where that business and friendship thing hit a wall and something had to, had to change. And, um, basically I had to leave, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it wasn't necessarily a easy decision and it wasn't necessarily my decision. You know, it was a good learning experience in hindsight and looking back and now these, we were, wasn't necessarily a good thing at the time. It created a lot of tension, but now, you know, we're, everything's water on the bridge and, new perspective on that and it was one of the major pivotal points in my career and probably one of the best things that could happen so i kind of left lucid visions uh in you know like just crushed i kind of been kicked out of this studio that i'd built um helped build right and then uh my girlfriend at the time got an opportunity to move to miami and so i just kind of tagged along with her like this kind of broken little fucking puppy dog like didn't know what i was gonna do (laughs) had no studio and just moved to Miami, had no studio or do any way to do anything. Um, there were no freaking glass blowers down there that I knew of. So, um, anyway, yeah, I, uh, moved down there and she had an opportunity at the university of Miami and which transitioned into her assisting the glass professor at his private studio, Oh wow! which, which turned into me helping him out part time too. And then me helping him out full time as well with her. So, um, I kind of took a couple of years off flame working in a way and was the casting assistant to a glass caster who was also the professor at the university. Man, you must learn um, a lot of stuff too doing that. Well, it wasn't it's funny. I learned a lot of stuff, but I also learned I didn't know shit about glass <laughs> or art. Right, right, exactly, absolutely. And so what ended up happening was um 
yeah i i uh i and and learned a whole new way to approach my work you know um or a way i saw the way kind of established and successful artists approach their work um so i learned a lot about casting you know um and mold making and cold working um and then i got hooked up and did work with a ceramics professor and then you know also was working with the the sculpture so I, I was able to see all kinds of craftsmen and other mediums at like a really high skill level and also a really high conceptual artistic level mm-hmm. work so at the time you know i'm still in the middle of this fucking funk where like i just got kicked out i'm just trying to keep my head above water i can't blow glass i'm depressed about that i'm just trying to pay the bills i'm taking odd jobs and at a certain point i realized like this is actually probably one of the best learning opportunities i have you know yeah um and the professor that i was working for was actually the chair of the art department and one of the the he's kind of known as the guy in um glass at the time as, as far as the university goes um um that created really great programs created put out amazing grad students and like that were kind of the top of the top of the young emerging artists at the time and um so he was really good at helping people develop right and so what i what i got was this little mini maybe kind of grad schooly experience if i paid attention to what was going on and i I did and that, that really helped out as far as how my work personal work developed and eventually how my pipes developed um uh yeah so it was it was really a huge a huge deal taking a couple years off flame working being crushed understanding i didn't know shit um and then um kind of re-emerging out of that cocoon um and, and after miami moving to austin to kind of use all that information and and uh push on the gas again yeah, and Austin's a, a definitely a creative community. I've never been there myself, but just from you know South by Southwest, yeah. and everything else that goes on there, and you know I'm familiar with the, the yeah. dichotomy of the town. It's like just such a cool place. Yeah, it is. It's a it is interesting. You know, I've always heard good things about the place. Um, never really been here. You know, and at a certain point in Miami, I uh, I just had to leave. You know, I didn't. Nothing was going right for me there. Um, not that nothing was going right, but it just cost so much to live. Could barely keep my head above water. There's no real glass culture. I was like, wait a minute, you know. And and um, I had uh, become single again, you know, and was like, oh shit, I don't have to be here. Like, <laughs> right. I can go anywhere, you know. Like, yeah. I'm a flame worker too. Like, all my shit packs up into boxes, right? And so uh, I did. I kind of got rid of everything I owned. Um, everything I owned uh, pretty much fit into like six uh, twenty. 20 by 20 boxes and I just shipped found a found a uh, apartment in Austin I could take over the lease on for six months shipped everything there and I, I had uh, one contact that hooked me up with a studio where I could I could work and I was like well shit here we go and uh, drove my little freaking Mazda Miata to uh, uh, Austin Texas and uh, started just immediately fell in love with the city and the the creative community and it reminded me of Seattle in the '90s, where the the music was amazing. There was a bit of an edge to the city. It was this weird mix of like a red state and the state capital. So you had this conservative government and one of the biggest universities in the country. So you had this super liberal student body. So there's this weird, you know, uh, mixture of like it's like brackish water. You know, there's like salt water and fresh water, and it's like mixing and it's like doing crazy shit all the time, and it's really cool. Yeah. Um, and it's just growing now exponentially, which is the, the the locals are having a hard time with, you know. But I I I, I understand that that's kind of how it happens when something becomes attractive and cool. P- other people want to be involved, you know. And I was one of those people. But I think as long in a place like this, as long as you add to the culture, as long as you add to the personality of a city, even if it's growing and you don't just suck it out, mm-hmm. um, then it's going to remain uh, creative and positive place so i'm trying to give back as much as possible while i'm here yeah yeah that's, uh, that's killer and, yeah so at what point in time did uh or who i should say who in a sense introduced you to uh to lucan um so yeah let's see there's a huge flame working community in austin mm-hmm. um and uh eventually we just i just kept hearing about this lucan guy you know 
And uh, it's funny, his email address at the time was actually that Lucan guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> um, yeah. That's so him, and, though. Um, it makes total sense. Yeah, right? Um, and so we met and um, immediately kind of hit it off. We have uh, Our work couldn't be more different, but personality-wise and kind of um, creatively, we have a very similar mindset. Um, but our work was different enough that the discussions we had were really um, – I don't know, they really, they weren't necessarily critical, but the, the way they made us think uh, fired off those kind of critical thinking um, cells in our, in our brain. Like our, every time we had a conversation about work or about our work, I think we, our work evolved a little bit. Mm -hmm. So slowly but surely we started hanging out more often. At a certain point we realized we shared a lot of these same stories, not just necessarily glass stories, but life stories of like how, um, you know, either tragic incidents that changed our life course and like all these things where our lives really mirrored each other's at the same times in our life it kind of made sense why we got along so well because we were shaped in a similar way, personality wise. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at a certain point we realized we have the same birthday. Oh, um, no shit. Nice. Yeah. And so all these things we realized, all right, we're, we're going to be buddies. Twinsies. Um, yeah, so we uh, we ended up. He's probably one of the closest friends I've ever had, you know, um, which is great, especially in the industry. And you know, I got to work next to him. I got to see Salt be born. If nobody knows who Lucan is, he's he goes by Salt. Yeah. Um, he's you know, he's I don't know, he's whatever. You may have heard of him. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> he's kind of a big deal some places. <laughs> um, or his work has you know had been. You know, he was. I watched this guy named my buddy named Lucan create this uh style uh and create salt you know um and you know it's not necessarily people weren't doing uh, similar stuff um but uh i watched him take this style and way of expressing himself and develop it into just kind of an amazing body of work an amazing kind of uh and watch this artist being born, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful part about Lucan is he's just as talented business-wise as he is artistically. And so it was a great learning experience working next to him and seeing how how that developed. Um, but um, yeah, it's, he's 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 great. And so you know he's he's been able to he's given me a lot of opportunities, and I tried to pass those back and forth. I brought him up to Finland a lot. And, um, um, it's been a great relationship and now i work in the studio with him and snick and a bunch of other guys here in austin but um hell yeah yeah super influential on me still has been and still is yeah same with me man because like i remember when i first saw the uh uh what the hell is that book having a brain fart that came out the first book about the pipes oh smoke oh, the, smoked um, volume one yeah. And uh, I saw him in there, you know, and it was cool because, you know, there was a questionnaire. Everybody's asked the same questions, you know, did the glass ever get you laid? What's your worst injury? That kind of shit. But his yeah. his perspective on his work was so philosophical. And at that point in time in my life, I was I was going through the same kind of trying to find my way with my work. I was doing a lot of production stuff, just paying my bills. I was in a shitty marriage. I mean, you know, I wasn't really happy with life, but the philosophies and stuff I was reading was really what kept me going. And when I came across his work and saw his philosophy and that actually actually had a philosophy about his, his work and the whole idea of the teeth yeah. protecting him from the outside influences or the government or whatever, yeah. you know, it was like, it was so unique that yeah. I've just, I latched onto him. Cause like early on in my career, like bear claw and Jag were like my two favorite artists and they still to this day are two of my favorite artists. And oh, yeah, and then Salt came in the picture, and I'm like, who the hell is this guy? And then all of a sudden, it was like yeah. his body of work just kept going and going and going. But then when I came to the point to where I realized you two guys were working together, I could see where his technical side was influenced from your technical side, in a sense. But then your technical side was influenced from his technical side. It's like, oh, yeah. It's a cool, you know, this symbiotic relationship well, that the two of you guys had or still he do. Al he also, yeah. And then he fucked up my alias again. Cause like, so the first time we collaborated, really. I changed my alias to Peppa just to fuck with him. Um, so then it was like, yeah, these are salt and pepper pieces, you know? <laughs> and then, and then the motherfucker like took that piece, got it photographed and sent it off. And it was on like a cover of at the time a magazine in, in our world. And then motherfucker. Now I'm known as pepper. I'm like <laughs> Jesus. So at a certain point, like fucking this 
Pepper got accused of biting goat scrote style, and like <laughs> I'm just like, fuck, man, I don't know what oh, to do man. now. Like, yeah. Oh, what if anybody uh, out there has like, I, I have an original goat scrote. <laughs> They're like, who the fuck yeah, is that, dude? <laughs> yeah, dude, mo- don't mess with the scrote. That was, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh god, yeah. Um, I wonder if I ever even signed pieces like that. That would be hilarious if oh, somebody man. was like, holy shit. Yeah. I have a goat scrote. Um. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, we've we've kind of bounced back and forth. It's been it's been really cool. And then also to see him develop this, not just uh, you know um, conceptually, but like technically, you know, you look at kind of those sculpted pieces, that like when people call it like dirty sculpting, where it's just like real quick and heavy carves, and like you, you look at this and you're doing things to the material that you've been taught that don't work, right, mm-hmm. or that aren't archival. Um, I've watched him turn something that may be volatile into a style that is really stable. And it's funny if you ever get to see him work compared to someone else that does stuff that's similar, you will understand that like he's actually doing this in an extremely different way than anybody else. Hmm. And that if you ever get it, anybody out there ever gets to take a chance, gets a chance to take a class from him. It'll be the best thing you've ever done. Even if you don't want to work with that style, Yep. You will learn more about the material. He has such a deep understanding of the material and can ex- talk about it in a way that is easily easy to absorb that I think he's probably one of the best teachers out there. Yeah. And, I, and I've seen a lot. So Yeah, I've heard that from yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, uh, you know, and then um, that kind of led me up to, uh, in, in Austin here, that kind of led me up to the Penland, the whole Penland um, blur that has been the last four years of my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, at a certain point, Lucan and I both went to AGI in Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, Tom Donner was put on this event and still does, or I don't know if he's, he's taken a little bit of a step back, but, um, it was this cool little gathering in the middle of nowhere, um, where a bunch of plane workers would get together and kind of collaborate and trade ideas. Uh, and Lucan and I went up there and I, uh, I met Carmen Lazar, who um, has always been one of my favorite artists in general, and she flame flame worker. Um, and uh, we hit it off, and she kind of asked me to be her teaching assistant at Penland. Um, and uh, I'd never been able to take a class at any of these craft schools. They're super expensive. At least at the time, we were like, oh, my God, how would I ever save up that $3,000 to take a two-week class? That's right, ridiculous. Right. You know? <laughs> And after I go there, I'm like, that would have been the cheapest, best thing I ever could have done for myself. Like that, those, that money and that two weeks would have changed my whole career because even, I guess, what was it? Like 12, 13 years in the first class I took there changed everything. Mm-hmm. It changed it. in five minutes. Carmen changed my whole perspective on my work, how I make it, what I think about, you know, and it was her. And it was also being in such a immersive educational experience where you're you're in the studio 16 hours a day with your instructor with your other students you're eating with everybody else on campus if, it, if anybody doesn't know penland is a it's called penland school of crafts and um when you hear i like to to make clear when you hear crafts um a lot of people think you're hot gluing macaroni onto fucking paper plates and shit <laughs> but like this is traditional craft media um, where it's like ceramics, uh, glass, um, you know, metals, small metals, jewelry making, metal smithing, uh, print making, a letter press, uh, you know, book making, paper making, blacksmithing, carpentry, like uh, everything, woodworking, you know, like everything top to bottom that people do with their hands at an expert level. This is where you go to study with masters. You know, in an immersive environment, yeah. you can in a two week class, you can get a full semester's worth of knowledge from a person that would never teach at university. You know, you'll never get access to them. Huh. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's funny as pipe makers, we tend to reject the people that have ignored us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I did for sure. Where it's like, you guys don't fucking pay attention to us. Why should I give you the time of day? And I. I actually respect that opinion a lot because, you know, fuck that. That's that was really hard for a long time being discriminated against because of an object you make yep. by other people that just make objects, you know. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, but when I went there I realized like um that isn't everybody. And when you relate to somebody on a level of like we all make stuff 
um, that goes away. And the amount I learned from the 85 year old weaver sitting next to me at lunch was astounding, you know, and the fact that when I talked to her about pipes and was able to relate to her on a way of making something, a person that has never touched marijuana in her life, let alone a pipe, even tobacco pipe, but talking to her about why I make it and what I think about when I make it is that she was totally into it, you know? And, oh, yeah. um, so you put yourself in these situations that you, you kind of have typically rejected, you know, and it took me 13 years to do it and I kind of had to be drug there and realized like, man, it kind of sucked that, that our relationship with other people because of what we make gave me this resentment towards these traditional ways of learning that are actually fucking amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I got to assist her and then I got to come back and teach, you know, there's a strict no pipe policy there. Um, and so that was always awkward to figure out like how to do that. And then, and then they have this residency program that I learned about, you know, and I said, like I said, like I had all the time I'd been making this artwork sculpture on the side. Um, and it, it got enough attention to get me these opportunities. Um, and then I applied for this residency um, which I'd never applied. I, you know, I knew I've heard that word before. I didn't really know what a residency meant or was. Yeah, I was, nasty I was teaching a two month. Yeah. I just want to explain that. Um, to um, yeah. So while I was there teaching, when I was teaching, I actually taught what's called a concentration, which is a two month class. And, um, at, at every class they do this open house at their, they have resident artists at this school. And so you go down to this big old barn and you see these seven people that, have been given an opportunity to be a resident artist at Penland. And what that means, residencies in general, typically can be any, any length of time, really. Typically, they're pretty short. Let's say a long residency would be six months, and a short one would be like a week. And they do them at schools or teaching facilities or, or just you know different places um, all over the world. And um, typically you'll go as an artist and they'll give you some resources um, and you're just exposing yourself to say whatever they have to offer as an institution or creative space. And you know, that's influencing what you make. And it's, it's a way to kind of um, get you into a new spot and bring in new people into their, their spot and um, kind of further this creative collaboration. Um, that's a very general way of explaining some residencies. Mm -hmm. Now, Penland's residency is very similar, except it's extra long, uh, and it's three years. Wow. And what they do is they you apply, and you're competing against a bunch of people. It's rather hard to get. Um, and then if you get accepted, it is uh, you, they give you a studio, uh, an apartment, and meals for three years. And you make whatever you want. You have no obligation to the school whatsoever incredible uh, except except to make what you want now the studio you get is empty uh it's just a space so you bring your studio and you have to pay for your overhead still which is you know your electric your gases um and uh, all that type of stuff um so you're still paying your studio overhead they basically just supplement your rent and throw some some food at you um and then but you're also kind of on this campus so every every year um, you know, every two weeks, 200 students come in with 15 uh, amazing instructors for these classes, and you're right there, right? So you get access to this, the instructors and this crazy creative, um, you know, just this energy that's around you all the time. And they're at this peak creative freaking energy level for yeah. two weeks. I mean, they just, you're blowing out. Like, you just, you leave that place uh, just a shell. You've just given everything you can give to your expression or your medium, right? Mm. So for two weeks, you go crazy and you leave, like, can barely stand. And then, right? And then fucking 200 more people come in <laughs> and their energy levels at the ceiling. And that's contagious, you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah, sure. So you end up making a lot of work. It's exhausting. And um, while it's an amazing experience, it's fucking brutal, man. You put a lot of pressure on yourself to make work. And to do things that look good towards this school, um, you know, to reflect good on this opportunity they've given you. And at a certain point when I, so I received this residency and moved my life to Penland. And um, at a certain point realized, like, I've applied with this other body of work because, you know, I knew that that's, they had this no pipe policy and blah, blah, blah. You've just learned over the years to, like, you know, 
keep keep it separated until you know it's the appropriate time to to you know talk about it as a pipe maker coming from the 90s it's just kind of how we we've developed you know Mm -hmm. a lot some of us especially people that didn't kind of stay in the northwest where it was more of a uh, outlaw subculture pop culture cool thing to do if you were anywhere else that it maybe wasn't you learned to kind of keep a a dividing line or isolate one from the other until you knew it was cool to like talk about it right yeah yeah so at a certain point, I realized they may not know that I'm a pipe maker <laughs> at Penland mm-hmm. after I moved up there. At least the people that mattered, like that maybe could uh, could uh, ask me to leave. You know, I don't know. But all I knew was I spent every dime I had moving out there. And that now I didn't know if they're going to ask me to leave. And I didn't know if I could – the only way I was going to actually pay those the, the overhead and those bills and facilitate the things I wanted to make while I was there – was to make pipes to to sell to pay the bills. So that first six months at Penland was fucking scary, man. Um, you know, I didn't know what to do. Like I realized, like you know, there was actually one of I'm not going to name names, but like somebody I really respected, uh, um, an older generation flame worker artist, you know, had called the school and made it very clear that that they didn't like the fact that a pipe maker was there mm. and that they should not have that there. And so they happened they, over and over again. That, they kind of called you out in the process, huh? Well, the, yeah, somebody outside of that whole situation was like making a big fuss about me being there. Yeah. And like that just added to my like insecurity of the whole situation. Luckily, in the long run, I figured out the people that mattered had known all along and they had, had my back, right? And another with the resident artists, not only was like, you don't have anything to worry about, number one, and you're being a fucking pussy. Why don't you just take this shit head on and go get it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. He was like a great carpenter, more from the punk rock generation than the grunge generation with me, you know? Uh-huh. And like, you know, and uh, so he was just like, fucking man up and do this shit, you know? Like, this is your chance. Um, and so that's when I just decided that those fucking two portfolios that I kept separate, when I give my slideshow the first time and I only put the uh, the artwork in there and told the story of my artwork, there are these huge holes of like, I had no stories about galleries. I had no stories about shows. You know, I had no stories about anything. I just had these this work, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I realized after seeing other people's, other like established artists' slideshows and them talk about their work that like mine was lacking in a way because I had to leave out 80% of my story. Um, and what happened was I realized that they wanted me there because of that work. They wanted me there because I, whatever happened in my life led me to make this work and it was creative and they thought it was interesting. What was the most interesting part was the story that I had to leave out and how that work was made and got to be made. Um, and as soon as I started to combine those two as soon as i started to tell my pipe story with my art story not only was did the work make more sense but i was more confident i was able to talk to these people about pipes in a way that they totally understood like and you know this is also the community or the people that are easiest to talk to because they make things with their hands they we we share that language so i learned the kind of the proper steps to disarm people's initial hesitation with pipes um in that kind of art world even the hot shot people yeah Uh, it turns out most of the people that had a problem with pipes and have forever have been the hot glass people more so than any other medium i can't tell you how many times i sat at lunch for within like i said that 80 year old weaver uh that was like you know i saw this really great documentary on netflix the other day you know (laughs) i'm talking about degenerate art yeah and I was like, yeah, I was actually, there's some of my, I'm in that movie for a second. There's like a little clip, you know, and they were like, that's amazing. It's so cool. Um, so there was a lot less resistance to it than I thought. But what has happened is we've been in this glass world and it's more, it's this flame working uh, slash hot shop conflict. And then pipe making is a subculture amongst flame working, you know. And so there's this weird tension that has been there forever that's disappearing now. And I don't think anybody really gave a shit. And that's the other thing I learned was like, nobody really gives a shit. And if you can talk about your work intelligently, 
and somebody doesn't like it, well, they're just a fucking asshole. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with what you make. It's like, oh, I wouldn't want to hang out with those people anyway. Um, there's there's assholes all over the board. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just um, the people that um, you want to talk to in life are the people that kind of respect you and what you do. Yeah, I agree. Um, it doesn't matter if it's pie making or anything else. There's going to be people that are just dicks, right? Um, so we take it we took it very personally in that it was about the pipe, but really we were just talking to assholes. And and maybe we didn't quite know the way to approach people to kind of give them a, a better, you know, perspective on our work. And that's what I learned. Um, and um, once that happened, that was in the first year of that residency. Not only was I able to talk about it more, but it also gave me a new perspective on why I make the work that I do. Um, and then why I make the pipes that I do and what I like about the pipes and what I like about the art. And what was most surprising about that residency was I came out of it with um, not only a great art portfolio and a better understanding of what I do and why I do it and what I want to make with my art side. But I also came out of it with what I love about the pipe and why and uh, and why I had I had been weirdly kind of ashamed at, in a weird way. I hate using that word because that's not exactly right. But there was this weird tension yeah, with that object. Mean. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and then, um, and then how uh, now that I real now that I could talk about it with like, yeah, you know what? I smoke weed. When I was twenty four, I smoked it like it was fucking going out of style, and you know that was my lifestyle. And now that I'm forty, marijuana isn't my lifestyle, but it definitely still complements my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I still use it. I still love it. And it's just I don't do it in the same way. And the objects that I use to, to consume it reflect, you know, that, you know, back then, you know, I'm not looking for a big bubbler to get really crazy with, you know, I'm looking for an intimate, I'm not passing it around to a group of people either. Like right. if I smoke marijuana now, it's um, in more of an intimate experience. It's usually just me in the studio or in a sketchbook or watching a movie or maybe in one or two other people and, um, so the work that I make now in the pipe world, I think reflects who I am more than it ever has. It's closer to fine art than it ever has been for me. And I am, couldn't be happier, um, as a pipe maker because I think for the first time for me, it's crossed over to, you know, my art. Yeah. I uh, agree. Just in the, I agree. in the way that I make it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, so anyway. I think your work definitely has an expression to it. That is a fine art, you know, like there's a couple guys out there that to me stand alone yourself, salt, Jag, Joe Peters, uh, coil at times. Like there's, you know, there's, there's guys that, that like, including yourself that have really taken the technical side of, of the fine art of it and created it as a functional pipe, which then transcends all genres of glass blowing. Because there's still that argument out there: is glass blowing a craft or is it an art? You know, it's like with Chihuly came out, it was always that right. kind of that that whole stigma. I still had it was a craft. It was a craft. The bead makers at home working in their house making little beads and stuff, which I've seen yeah. some amazing bead work that I would consider to be so close to being a fine art because of the amount of detail and time and work that goes into making these fucking beads. But then you get into well, yeah, you know. But then, but, but what you're seeing now, it's like That's I mean, you know, I go through your your Instagrams and look at your portfolio in there in a sense, and it's like. You can see where it started from the beginning of Penland to where you are now, and it's like, yeah, it's crazy. Well, it's also, you know, that that it's like that's you know, going from a craft school. You know, there's that art, art versus craft debate is, is is like, it's one of those things that comes up all the time, and it's interesting. And then you're beating your head against the wall because you realize that definition of art is so fucking subjective, mm -hmm. and the people's definitions of crafts, you know, go from from you know. Uh, the design world to Hobby Lobby, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, people can think anything's art and anything is craft, and it's just like we all have to like sit down at the beginning of this and like establish our definitions and like a starting point, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's funny, and um, and Lucan and and this is a philosophy that I've adopted, not a philosophy, I guess, but a, an observation about what a craft object or an object of design can do, right? And it, and it's um, so let me let me just say this like I the reason I love the pipe so much and a lot of just objects that you deal with on a daily basis is that it's the unique relationship you build with it right it's tactile it's functional 
um, it's um, you use it to consume a substance that makes you contemplate things. It makes you look at that object and pay attention to it in a way that you don't pay attention to any other object you have, basically, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and especially being a glass object, it's like, you know, in the sculptural world or art world, you, you buy a sculpture and you put it on that pedestal and it doesn't come off. You don't take it down and pass it around. Um, you build a relationship with this object. It fits in your hand, uh, the, the way it fits your mouth, you know, the, the way that um, the ratio between the bowl and that you, you understand every little nook and cranny of this piece because you've inspected it. What a better way to deliver your ideas to then a pipe like it's in their hand they're looking at it like if you have something to say and you put it in that they're gonna fucking see it yeah now and not only see it they're gonna pass it to the next dude and now guess what they're gonna put it in a fucking pelican case take it on a plane and take it across the country how many other pieces of artwork actually get to do that i know bro you I know just, I, I agree 100 percent. i crazy. love it my some of my favorite things that i i see on instagram when people tag me in pictures of my work is when they take my little owls out into the woods and it's on a fucking mountain with this amazing landscape in the background or it's in the snow, you know, to put it out in the environment. But they're out there in the environment using it in this ceremonial way, like you're saying. It's such, yeah. a, it's such a, a unique expression as an artist with the medium that will fuck you up if you're not careful. You know, yeah. and, and for us to be able to take that and manipulate it in a way where it manipulates us as well. But then we create this ceremonial object, like you're saying, that people look at and they know every little intimate nook and cranny of that piece when they as they own it. You know, it's it's such a unique opportunity yeah. as an artist to express yourself in this medium. You know. Yeah, and that now it's for me. It's and uh, and this is where I would like to like, I mean, not necessarily challenge other artists, but I think the the cool part now is it's time we're, as we're maturing as a as a group of makers as pipe makers and people that are interacting in the pipe world is that um i think it's time for a little bit of a discourse on on and a bit of a like critique on like what we're doing and why we're doing it and what the we have access to change things we actually have access to put ideas onto these things to really interact with the culture mm -hmm. and i don't know if we're necessarily doing that right now we got a lot of high-fiving going on and not a lot of like is this a nice object is this uh is this pretty? Is this, is this, uh, you know, well designed? Is this, you know, um, so, I mean, we're at this unique time now that we have this tension where people are looking at us. It's like, are we saying things that deserve to be taken really seriously? And I think a lot of people are, you mm -hmm. know, I think, but as a group, we can really start to think more about not just how we're making things, but why we're making things and the ability that this object has to translate messages. Mm -hmm. And um, just because we're this young, most of us are this younger group that, you know, smokes weed doesn't mean that we don't have interesting things to say. And that's a stereotype we've been fighting for a long time is that this burnout pothead bullshit. And it's just like, no, this is just a, a substance that doctors and lawyers and everybody from burnouts to, you know, um, professors, you consume mm -hmm. and that um well, now we have it this we have this tool of to, to get our ideas out and it's time we really start i think it's time that as a group of pipe makers we kind of really think about that and start to use that in 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 ways maybe we haven't as a group done you know yeah for sure I think, um, especially with technology the way things have changed for us as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it's cool i mean i with me, I think the one thing I've learned is that, like, um, where I really about myself in this at the Penland thing and everything else is that I've always had this fine art stuff, these expressions that I have to get out. But as far as the pipe goes, or is my real zen in the studio when I make an object, a craft object like a pipe, was just like I love that R and D zone, right? That discovery period, mm -hmm. and I love simple design. You know, when I look about what I would want to own as a pipe or as furniture or whatever it's like it's starting as i start to get older and i my tastes narrow and i realize like what i re really enjoy is that i really like these kind of simple clean efficient well thought out objects yeah yeah uh, um and that uh i think i'm transitioning into more of a designer um than an artist right and that's and i think those are both 
equal. <laughs> I don't think that's one or the other is a higher form of expression, you know? Yeah, I completely I think there's agree. A, there's a difference with, the, with, with modern design, with design and, and art is there's, there, there's, they're saying, typically they're saying kind of two different things. One, it, art is, is a little bit of, hey, look at me. And design is a little bit more of, hey, look at this, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I am much more comfortable pushing the attention away from me and towards the object. Um, so I think that's where I realized, like, I love that design process more than the art. Is I'm self-conscious with people. I'm self-conscious taking praise. I'm self-conscious people looking at me sometimes. Um, but I'm, I really like it when people appreciate that object I make um, and for their own reasons, right? They yeah. develop that relationship with it. That's their personal relationship. It isn't necessarily, I haven't told them what to think. I've just given them the opportunity to, to think. Um, I think that's very important. And um, it's just as valuable as, as uh, a piece of art that is, you know, has a very intense, specific purpose a very specific message the uh, an object that just inspires you to think is just as important without giving you a specific message so yeah, um, I, I love both i love both sides and i respect both sides of the art world and the pipe world um i think i'm transitioning to focus more on that object of design rather than the object of expression um you know which they both cover, but one leans harder on one side than the other. Oh but yeah, that's that's what I've learned at Pinland, I think, and um, yeah, that's killer. Hey, yeah. can you can we can we give me like two minutes, bro? I gotta take a pee real quick. Yeah, no, nope, actually, you know what? I'm gonna do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, I'll bust safe. Yeah, take. Quick I'm just gonna break. leave this. I'm gonna set this down. I'll be back. Yep, same here. <laughs> All right. So, All right. So, bye. Yeah. Cool. Are you? Yep. I am. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. Good time. So, yeah, I was like, oh, shit, let me go take pee. <laughs> Coffee's so good. <laughs> Man, it's so funny. Yesterday with Luke and uh, we just got into a uh, – we'd recorded a, a, our podcast. A, a, um, uh, we were recording a podcast, which kind of already done, but we were kind of re-recording it. And it got to a point where I was like, "Man, we've been talking for so long. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, got to. Oh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's the beauty of doing this. You can always just stop and – Hit, yeah. Hit pause and come back to it. And cool. on that same note, um, after we get done talking, um, I was gonna give you some notes on your guys' show. Yes, please. We were. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love that. Hell yeah, cool. So uh, yeah, man. So back on the fashion and art thing, uh, myself personally, I'm I'm in that same kind of transition myself. Like, um, I got remarried almost, I guess, two years ago now. But we've been together for four. And my wife's an elementary art teacher, and she's got an amazing sense of fashion and design to her like just so know like how she dresses and carries herself and what have you and she's uh we get el decor magazine in the mail and i never really was into reading design magazines necessarily like i've done i have so like architectural digest and different ones in the past right. but getting going through all the core and it really opened my mind to the idea of of being a designer of the actual concept of having seasonal fashions in a sense you know right yeah and and conceptually wise, I think as a business, it works well too, because then you can take a line. I mean, shit, you could take like, say, you know, four lines that you do annually. And every year you come back to that, that line in that season and you just can completely, you can change it or evolve it or make it better than it was the previous year, constantly expounding upon that concept. And that's kind of what I've gotten into. And yeah, and having my opportunity with Disney as well as, as, has influenced that too. Um, but it's really opened my mind to the just just to that concept of being a designer because there's so you know there's so many different trends like right now one of the new trends i'm seeing in in the in pipes um in the recyclers is like the the hourglass floating recycler kind of concept um yeah and i see and the, and there's amazing work being done but it's still a lot of people are doing it it's there's a lot of you know every, everybody has their own yeah. version of it but there's still a lot of people doing it my goal which i'm sure is yours as well same with salton a lot of guys is to have your own thing you're doing that people may copy your work, which is whatever and hold another conversation, yeah. but you're still yeah. pushing the elements of what you want to do yourself with your work, your line, your creative side, your ideas and concepts. And I, I know myself, I can do recyclers. I can probably, I've never done a client before. I want to do it just for the technical side of it, just to do it. I'm sure yeah. I could cause 17 years doing this shit. I mean, I'm sure I could just about do anything right now, but I want to do things that I can't do. I want to push myself yeah. to do things that I've never done that I don't know if I can do it or not. 
And yeah. and that's what I see with your work is you've really taken the con like Ham's the same way. Like I appreciate his work yeah. because of the technical side of what he does, pushing the limits, thinking outside the box. Like like your flat your your disc cyclers that you're doing, you know, like yeah, it's such a cool concept. Like you know, nobody's doing that. I mean, Ham's done some window window ones he was doing, which yeah, were, you know, completely awesome. But like when I saw Salt's perk that he's doing, you know, yeah. it was like that made so much fucking sense. So yeah. I was like, I bet you I could do that. So. I made one of my wise guy mini tubes. I made it, made did the same freaking thing. I didn't want to post any pictures of it on anywhere or yeah. anything. I just made it for myself because I knew that if I I had to try that idea. Well, yeah, you know, and th and that's how. We, and, and it's so funny too. It's like, yeah, right. I mean, I have a pretty high uh, threshold as far as like. I mean, that's not the right the right way to phrase it, but like, I'm highly critical of myself and being original, right? And there's only there's a certain amount of influence I'm willing to take and then transfer mm -hmm. before I have to check it and be like, OK, how much of this is yours and how much are you just straight taking from someone else? You know, and that's there's nothing wrong with kind of uh, um, seeing something and playing with it and kind of figuring out how that fits into your work. But I think we're um, it, which is like, you know, what you were just talking about. And then and then you go like that's amazing. That's great. And it, it, you kind of put yourself in their shoes and, and like see how they came to that decision or those decisions, you mm -hmm. know, and then it's a matter of like, well, how do I make this into something that adds to that conversation instead of just um, parrots that conversation, you know, with the material and that design, Yeah. you know, and that's very important. It's what you were just talking about. It was like, you know, you don't want to put it out there until you figure out what, you know, what that means to you and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. And, yeah. Um, and that's one thing that's missing in the con critical, the conversation of that we're having with our work right now is there's a lot of people that are like, Oh man, that's interesting. I'm going to, you know, figure out how that works and see how it's made. And they never stop to go like, Oh, I'm just repeating the same shit except now going like, look what I did instead of like, look what they did. Um, yep. you know, how can I do this? You know, at, at Pimlin, there was this great guy, Thor Bueno, when I was up there, it taught this, the last class I taught at Pinland, oh, which I want to touch on too. One more thing about that, but he was talking to one of my students to JD Mapleton actually mm. about something. And he was, he says, you know, they were talking about that subject and they, he says to JD, he's like, you know, you know, at a certain point, my philosophy is it's like, it's okay to follow in my footsteps, but just don't fucking stand there. You know, <laughs> I was like, God, that's great. That I don't know. That probably wasn't his, you know, he probably, but it was the first time we'd heard it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, yeah, it was really, that was a really way to, good way to put it. And I think that that's an important conversation that should be developed amongst us uh, yeah, I agree. as well. Cause I can, under, I can understand taking someone's idea and trying to replicate it just so you can learn that technique but yeah. not to then say this is my thing. Like there's a couple guys out there right now that are doing goblin faces, which is always the go-to thing, yeah. the controversy of biting, right? Or, or even yeah. like the teleporter. I mean, it's, it's funny because it's always Shobo shit. No matter, no matter who's right. copying what, it's always Mike Shobo, um, right. which I appreciate his work, you know, just immensely. But it, but that being said, it's it's an interesting con or talk when you think about, okay, so someone, say, takes the goblin face, they recreate it exactly the same way Shobo makes it, the same master craft street or whatever you want to call it craftsmanship that goes into that piece yeah. now it de it devalues it obviously because it's not an original idea but if the right. craftsmanship is is done exactly the same high level of quality why can't the person duplicating it charge just as much as Shobo does now I know right. the answer to that but what do you how do you feel about that um well God, you know I mean why can't they? Yeah, like what you know, because like some of these goblins I'm seeing that these guys are making that are they yeah. look really good. They're selling them for like a hundred dollars. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like you can try to charge that much, you know. And you know what? It's funny. Is like, um, it's just it, the the value isn't in the object, and I think you know that as yeah, well. You yeah. know, uh -huh. um, and it's well, it's interesting too because in this collecting culture and like. Um, what makes that object valuable in the first place? You know. Yeah, that's my is, perspective. Is, is, exactly. is, is the artist and the scarcity and and the, their their you know the road that they took to make it? Mm -hmm. um, now, what's interesting is in this conversation is that what Shelbo is really good at too 
is promoting, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just, and this is just a hypothetical. Let's just not even make it a goblin. Let's say it's the same conversation, but it's something else. Like, say, uh, so somebody makes this object and is really well known for it and gets a great a high dollar for it. But now pretend that they were the third guy to do it. And the first two guys just weren't good at marketing. But the guy that is known for it is the third guy, mm-hmm. you know? And this is where the, like, this is where the problems are. Yeah, know? and that and that's my answer exactly. Is it's the marketing and the the avail- availability to get your work out in front of people for them to see it. Yeah. Whether they see it first or not, it's just a matter of fact of how you do it. How you market, yeah. And I, again, like that, what I just brought up isn't I, Shelbos, as far as I know, is is the guy that did the goblins. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's also very good at marketing. But that's where a lot of people fall off. You know, and and oftentimes the person to get known for something isn't necessarily the person that created it, you know, yep. that's a, a lot of the time, which is kind of unfortunate, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, especially in our little cutthroat renegade subculture world, you know, you see a lot of that, man. <laughs> it's just like you fucking sleep on something for a second, you know, you, you, you fucking, you lose it, you know, Yeah. you gotta be careful what you put out there sometimes, you know? Yeah. And that's, um, that's why I, for the longest time, dude, I didn't put my shit on anywhere on the internet for one. I don't want people copying my shit, which is whatever, but also I didn't want to go <laughs> overseas to China and have those fuckers, sell, you know, start copying that. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Right. So there's like dangers everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was gonna, um, oh yeah, I wanted to, um, kind of elaborate on one thing about that Pimlin experience. Yeah, yeah. Was the end of it, um, and what I was able to accomplish with, um, you know, how the institution itself looked down in pipes, not just how I, how I, um, myself developed my perspective on it, but, um, the cool part about it was that being in touch with everybody and being able to have that conversation, um, and building that cool relationship with the, the school and the people that program the classes. I was able on my way out to teach another two month class and um, have a conversation and um, with the people that program the class and get a advanced class, number one, which is kind of hard to do because everybody thinks they're advanced. I mean, when I was a year in, I thought I was better than I am now. That's for sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. <don't> um, <laughs> so I was like, fuck man, I'm at the expert level. Let's do this. Yeah. You know? Um, but so I teach an advanced class, number one, and then they allowed me to, to jury that class, which means I got to ask them to, people to submit portfolios and then uh, choose the people that were in that class. Um, and uh, again, there were there were a lot of people that knew my, about the pipe stuff for me and a lot of people that maybe didn't know the extent. And um, so I did that in order to be able to pick all pipe makers for this class, number one. Well, well number one, because typically they're the highest skill set out of any flame worker I'm going to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and then number two was to kind of expose the rest of this school that may not be comfortable with them still, outside of me, to a broad spectrum of a kind of, a, of, of the pipe community, you know, um, to see kind of what that's all about, you know. Um, And so I was able to program a class of all really talented, young, up and coming uh, pipe makers. And I tailored this class kind of worded it ambiguously so they would know that it's a pipe making class, but that it wouldn't come out right out and say it in a Pinland School of Crafts catalog. Right. right? (laughs) And uh, so um, and I was still kind of nervous about how this is going to go. Right. It could go either way. And I let them let the guys when a class assembled at the school. It's like, okay, guys, this is our chance. So we can like, I mean, we, we're all on the same team here. So I'm not asking you guys to like not be yourselves, but just be aware that uh, the magnifying glass is on you. You know, yeah. Like, and this is a chance to like show them, you know, um, what you're all about. I and mean, like, you know, this is it. You guys can tell your story. And I got to give my. It's a two month class, and every instructor gives a slideshow. Mine was that first week. Um, and then the first day of class, we have this instructor gathering, all the instructors and the, the head of the school kind of, um, get together. Um, and this, the, the, uh, director of Penland, uh, who's an amazing woman who uh, I had thought didn't know I was a pipe maker and might have a problem this whole time. Right. So I was nervous about her being, um, and, uh, in that first meeting, I, I told them all like, okay this is the class I've assembled and this is what they all do. 
And as instructors, like, I just want you guys to know that, you know, this is, it's going to be a topic of conversation across campus and that we treat this very seriously and we take this very seriously. And that if you could please come in, you know, interact with our class, you know, and, and if you have a problem, if you, that makes you uncomfortable, that that's going to be a topic of conversation, please come and talk to my students about their work, see how serious they are, you know, interact with our class. Um, if you're uncomfortable with it before you, you know, make it a problem. Uh, anyway, uh, and I gave my slideshow that first week and the, the, the director after that first meeting was like, you know, I'm going to, I want to come to your slideshow. I'm really interested in what you were just talking about. And so she comes to my slideshow and I made my slideshow about 80% of this hour long or 45 minute slideshow was about the pipe culture and other pipe makers and kind of what's going on under people's noses in this craft subculture that at this craft school, nobody really knows about. And after the slideshow case, she came up to me and was like, that was awesome. She's like, I'd always known that you, you know, came from that world and that you still worked in that world and that you made pipes here, you know, you've been very respectful about that. And she was like, but I really had no idea the extent of the subculture. And she was like, it, that, um, something like she's like that belongs here. This is really exciting. As wow. far as I'm concerned, you, you guys can make whatever you want. And so after that first week, we got the full okay to make pipes at a craft school that is typically one of the most conservative craft schools out there. Phenomenal. And so we did a seven week fucking crash course in like, let's go make pipes and collaborate and talk to everybody about it and be respectful and talk about it seriously. And um, I think we impressed the shit out of out of that whole world. And um, it really uh, was a really cool experience. It was, um, um, but that also led me in to being able to, you know, do the same thing at Pilchuck, and then most recently, do the same thing at Corning, um, which a friend of mine in Asheville uh, compared to the Ber Berlin Wall of glass coming down. Um, <laughs> yeah, totally, dude. Being able to make make a pipe at a at a Corning class. Yeah, um, that but, was the one to ask you about that, like having the ability to go from Penland to then go to all these major freaking glass schools and places like that and then bring the pipe into it. It's, it's congratulations. Yeah. I mean, it's fucking, that's amazing, dude. Like totally groundbreaking. Well, it's funny. So, but I, I still don't, um, I don't discriminate against people that don't make pipes either. Mm -hmm. So I never teach a strictly pipe making class. Um, the one at Penland, I just wanted all pipe makers in the class but we did all kinds of stuff that wasn't pipes, you know? And mm -hmm. so every class I teach, it's more of a skill class. I want to, I want you to leave knowing how to what make what you make better. Right. I want to give you maybe some tools that you don't have to make what you love to make in a better way. Um, that's the class I teach. And so, but what has happened in the past is like, I have pipe makers in there and I'm not able to give them that because they can't make what they want to make in the class. Right. Um, and so in the case of Corning, you know, when they called and asked me, I said, yes, but do you have, I heard you had a no, a no pipe policy. And they said, yes, we still have that. I said, well, that's, I understand that completely, but, um, in, um, the class I teach that isn't going to work, uh, in, you know, I would teach a design class and people need to be able to make what they design. So until that policy changes, um, you just kind of have to take me off the list of potential instructors, um. And she said, well, let me call you back. And she called me back and said, that's great. That's fine. Um, so again, I think what I learned mostly at Penland, and um, while it is kind of groundbreaking, it's kind of just the language you use mm -hmm. to navigate that topic, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. And it, it, it's been really interesting. That's the main, one of the other major lessons of like getting your, getting your message across is kind of learning how to deliver it. And I think that's also been what we've lacking as a culture is like, how to deliver the message um, in a way sometimes that's palatable. And that's, you know, some people are much more, um, like I said, like I'm a little bit of a pussy in that way where I, I want to, I will, I will figure out a way to navigate that. Right. And some people are, are more like, fuck you. This is the way I do it. Yeah. You know, I quitted it and this is a kind of a crude fucking, uh, comparison but i i i when when i was talking to jag jag was my ta at pilchuck i was like you're more of the guy that's like just 
spit on your hand and stick it in, but I, I'm more of a fucking put on some smooth jazz and get the lube out, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, like, you know, it's like, so, and there's nothing wrong with either way, you know? Um, but, uh, it's been an interesting, it's been a really interesting four years, uh, learning how to have that conversation. And I think it's helped open the door to now that next generation of people that are going to be much more like fundamentalist pipe maker. And I'm excited to see them get a chance to talk to tell their story about, you know, kind of the, 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 the other side of the pipe world. That's more of a full, full on fundamentalist pipe maker, you know, yeah. and I've been a, I've been a blend my whole career and I've never stepped away or just, you know, from the pipe. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, but I've always done the art as well. Whereas some people that some people in our world, you know, used to talk a lot of shit about pipes mm-hmm. until, until the money showed up and now they mm-hmm. jump in um like they were cool with it all along yeah. i think as somebody as somebody that never did that and always existed in both worlds without talking shit about either one i think i have a perspective that that on that that it rubs me the wrong way more than anybody else yeah i um, can imagine and i know they, uh i'm not gonna say but no uh, yeah they, we're not naming <laughs> names or anything but you know i think everybody understands that the, with the money comes you know but here's the deal it's like there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's I th- the other thing I, I, I realized. Yeah, I is like everybody changes, yeah. and the scene has changed, and the object has changed, and the culture has changed, and why can't people's fucking opinions of it change? You know? Yeah, I think um, when the person from so the other at the other it. spectrum comes in, it it creates some kind of credibility for the industry in a sense. You know, it's, which is a positive thing. Yeah. Even though yeah. they may have talked shit about the credibility of our industry at one point in time, and then by them coming into our industry it creates credibility. It is what it is, but still. Yeah. You know. No, I totally get it. I, you know, I understand. And the the interesting part too is this is just the beginning, right? And mm-hmm. we're looking at it from perspective of like other glass artists coming into the industry, flame workers coming into the industry that may have not been cool with it, um, you know, for most of the time. But the real big picture is that with the changing political dynamic, it's just like what happens when um, everybody else comes in, you know, when actual design world comes in, actual you know, manufacturing, like it's, this is just the beginning. And if you think it's just other artists from the glass industry that are going to cross over that are, that that's a, a interesting topic of conversation. Wait for the next five years when, you know, if everything fully legalizes, it's like when GE comes in and engineers a better way to smoke weed and we're all out of a job. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's all changing, but it's exciting at the same time because, yeah. because of that, yeah, yeah. like, like I'm, like I love Tesla and what he what the company in general yeah. has done for for electricity and for the automobile but the fact that they've then open sourced all their shit so that anybody who wants to fucking know how to, they did it has the opportunity to do it where our industry is very similar now where before when we started it was like Chinese nobody wanted to tell you anything you know secret 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 like we're still in fucking Venice or something like that where yeah. now it's like open source you know yeah. you have Dustin Revere doing his YouTube videos all these other guys that are doing videos I yep. have the podcast now. You guys got your podcast started. There's a lot of more talk about it. But my, what my concern is, which is what I'm trying to get myself involved in mostly with this show, is that when the laws change, our laws have to change for this industry. Because the cannabis industry, the farmers and growers and the dispensaries and those guys, they have representation, whether it's people in the government that are there, yeah. you know, out there talking and shit, you know, what have you. We have no representation right now. I mean, there's literally yeah. nobody in our industry that is out there speaking of a voice that, okay, Colorado changes their laws for cannabis, but how are they going to change the laws for pipes? And yeah. I brought Luke Zimmerman on the show a couple times. We've been talking about it, and, and he is one of the – he's actually – there's a cannabis bar up in Oregon now where lawyers are part of a cannabis bar where they're all learning the ins and outs of the, of the legalities of the cannabis industry on a state level. And yeah. it's so it's so fucked up because there's there's so much gray area out there right now for everybody that nobody knows who's doing what, when, where, and why. But yeah. once we get the representation for our culture and their culture, and we're working side by side, like Luke referred to it as like we're like the kid in the back seat, real long for the ride, where we need to be up in the passenger side saying, "Hey, we need to go off this exit right here." Yeah, you know, type of thing. So part of yeah. what my goal is is to get myself out there and it's kind of scary for myself because i've got kids and family and shit to do it but i feel someone has to do it hence why i started this podcast someone had to someone had to reach out to these people who are blowing glass in their bedroom to say you guys gotta stop doing this shit you're gonna kill yourself burn down your house and maybe kill your family in the process 
right you know yeah. type of thing and then also with degenerate art coming out and all these newbies starting them you know whatever else influ influenced me to get this going but now that yeah. laws are changing there has to be also now that perspective on what are we going to do and then like you're saying corporations start stepping in i mean fuck i, I, I saw in florida here as we were trying to get our medical stuff freaking costco and walmart and all these other places were, were already lined up to start selling grow accessories and kits and all this other crazy shit yeah. you know it's like fuck oh yeah like the, i heard <laughs> our fucking dollar general store down the street we have here in my local town is selling pipes they're made it out of china but they're selling little glass pipes in the fucking dollar store <laughs> yeah. now oh yeah you know? yeah and yeah, we're not and like we're not even anything legal i mean we're still 10 years down the road i mean i think this year we're going to have a, a medical but you know, it's an, it's an interesting dichotomy when you think about the way everything's evolved. And it's all evolving in a good way, but there's still some gray area that needs to definitely be. Oh, yeah. At, you know? it's, it, the thing is, is it's just like the, the rate of growth. You know, we're definitely going through some growing pains. You know, we're getting mm -hmm. some stretch marks because we're like, oh, shit. We're, you know, and um, that's the thing is it's like it's, I'm really happy that there are people that have that are, have a little bit more vision of like what needs to be looked forward. Right now, there's so much kind of money and momentum in this industry. It's really hard to not look to look past what's right in front of your face, you know, yeah. and to kind of look about, about what's in, down the road. Um, and it's really refreshing to know that um, people are people are looking at that, you know, that you're looking at that and, and more people are as well. But like, you know, our industry. Yeah, it's. That's good. It, it, it is. It's always been a gray area, you know, and it's getting less and less gray. Um, but, we, you know, we definitely need to have a voice. So, yeah. Like, are you aware that if you sell a pipe to somebody in a legal state, they had to be 21 to buy it? Yeah. No. Uh -uh. Yeah. Uh -uh. Didn't know that. Yeah. That's no, great. So, yeah. So you can sell someone a pipe in Colorado. They have to be 21. But if you sell it to somebody in Ohio, they have to be 18 because it's for tobacco. That's funny. <laughs> That's stupid. But if you're in well, it's funny. Well, it's, it's so yeah. funny because like so in Washington, like when I was like 19, I got caught with a pipe. Mm -hmm. And um, if it, if I was 21, it was just a two hundred dollar fine. But because I was 19, I had to go to jail for a couple days and pay a fine and lose my license. And uh, I was like, wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. You know, it was like and that was back in the 90s. And I, it's weird that that's I mean, that makes a sense that there's a bunch of weird bullshit that nobody fucking understands and knows about. And that's just the way it always was. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's weird, man. Because like that's what Luke and I were talking about. Like, if you sell part of the things, like we're saying, okay, if you're a company, say, in, in, in Colorado, and you're and you manufacture pipes for consumption of cannabis, you can say that now legally. But you have to also have a description on how the piece is used, why it's used, for what <laughs> it's used for, because it's going to get to a point to where we are going to be held liable, liably res responsible, potentially being sued in civil court if someone uses our product and is injured by it. Right. You know, like McDonald's coffee. You know, the lady burn her freaking crotch on their thousand degree coffee and made millions of dollars on it oh yeah the culture for us is the same way so we all got to start thinking about this sense of not only are we artists but we have to really be conscious about the whole business liability side for what it is that we do because yeah. as these laws change again we're gonna have to describe exactly how you use this thing but if you're selling it and making it for cannabis in colorado you cannot sell that same pipe outside of the state because then it becomes a federal issue Right. You know, it's like, it's, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, no kidding. Yeah. That's it. It's, yeah. It sucks. But it is what it is. And I like to bring this shit up because it's, it's just, to me, it's so important because living in Florida, I have dealt with this horse shit my entire career, 17 years now. And even before I yeah. even, you know, had my first pipe, I was still using, but way before that and had the yeah. appreciation for it, you know? So even still, yeah. I'm still paranoid working in my studio. <laughs> you know, it sucks. Well, I mean, just Florida in general has just always been a tornado of bullshit with the, with the paraphernalia, you know. So yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it, uh, more so than anywhere else I've, I've lived, for sure. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, kind of, kind of did move forward a little bit. Um, I, I, I noticed with which is something I appreciate with your work is that you use a lot of clear. You don't use yeah. a, lot, a whole lot of color. I'm the same way. I, I prefer clear myself with color accents. Do you do you do that because of the technical aspect to really show what goes into your work in a sense? Um. Yeah, I would. It's it's funny how that developed, right? Is like, if you look at my very early stuff, it was all like you know wigwags and and uh, you know just kind of everything you've seen out there. Mm -hmm. um, at a certain point, I started uh, trying to get the shapes to um, to work on my shaping more, right? I think it was uh, uh, um, 
but it, it, I realized that I, if I, sp I spent so much time patterning that by the time I went to shape it, I lost the balls to do those risky moves just because I might fuck up that pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I started doing was that prototyping um, out of clear um, just to get the shapes down so that when I did add the color, like I could make those moves and I would be confident. Um, and, uh, and so what ended up, what ended up happening was, uh, I made these clear prototypes and a, and a guy that worked at one of the local shops in Austin came in and saw them and was like, Oh, let me go sell that. I was like, Oh, it's just a prototype. And he was like, no, no, I can sell that. And I was like, Oh, well, if you think so, go ahead and take it. He comes back and was like, here, I got this much money for it. <laughs> and I was like, fuck dude. I thought that that's what I was going to charge for the colored worked ones, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, he, and I still had, I had another next, you know, next step of that prototype. Um, and he was like, let me take that one. And he kept doing that. And next thing I know, I was like, I kind of stopped using color, but what it, and then, um, but also people were like, didn't really know how complex it was that I was, what I was doing with these things. I mean, it was like, just because they were clear, they were still made up of like 30 pieces, Right. but you couldn't tell because the clear blended. And so actually the funny thing is why I started adding just the black lip wraps was just to differentiate the pieces so that people would know how many pieces there were to put in there. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah. And then, but that, and then I started really getting better at these lip wraps, um, OG lippy crew here, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, so I, uh, and then I started stacking them up, you know, two or three at a time and started realizing that's a really beautiful design element and started using that as my color and not necessarily to differentiate between the pieces, but now as a design element. Interesting. And, and it also mirrored what I'd learned at Pinland and that what I liked about like that simple, clean aesthetic, you know, um, and then it, it put more emphasis on the shape than the pattern. Um, and I think that that was a really important thing for me is, uh, is kind of introducing that conversation to people too, hopefully is that, you know, just because it's not, all color and fully worked um it's still an incredibly complex piece um that has more to do with the design than you know that the more to do with why i made it than how i made it you know what I mean? yeah absolutely yeah i think the, i think clear <clears throat> out of everything shows your flaws you know so. yeah well that's the other thing too is like people it's amazing what you can hide Yep. <laughs> with color yep. <laughs> you know and that i didn't understand how shitty my seals were until i, until I started working with all clear exactly. and they were still pretty good but they weren't as clean as i thought they were that's right for sure. just because they were smooth on that surface and i really thought i worked them in really good there was still a lot of optic ripple which is acceptable stability wise but mm -hmm. as far as i wanted everything to flow together like to to redistribute that ripple um was real cool thing to learn how to really blend clear glass so. yeah yeah can you hear my puppy in the background yeah can you... yeah. Yeah, yeah is she, is she loud she is pretty loud yeah <laughs> hold on one second she's annoying as shit because <laughs> mm -hmm. she'll start doing this and then oakley my other dog he's a husky uh, aussie mix and he starts yeah. howling and then she starts howling and next thing i know they're like singing to each other but it's like, <laughs> it's so loud it's like i sit here and i'll just like <laughs> laugh listening to these fucking dogs it's hilarious but that's awesome. This, That's is like, this, this is a common thing amongst my interviews. I'm like, hey, hold on a second. My dogs are being noisy. <laughs> Usually I don't mind it, but when she gets too loud, it's like, it, it's over. It's just too loud. So one sec. I'll be right back. No problem. All right. I'm back. All right. Always makes for fun radio. The beauty of editing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, man. It's, you know, it's funny on that, on that note with the, the, the how much stuff color hides. I've seen a, a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, but I guess that's for lack of a better term. Artists whose work I respect, and then I see it in person, and it's like, okay, this isn't as clean or as technical right. as I thought. But yeah. then I see your work, and it's like more technical than I thought. <laughs> right. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, holy shit, how the fuck did he do that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, you know, it's funny. So I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan of stand up comedy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I use this parallel a lot because of, you know, I think that that is a, a craft as much as anything. Yeah. Um, um, and it's just how funny how, how hard it is for them to refine and 
um, you know, n- make these uh, um, these sets and routines or just jokes and how they flow together and like and how they have to craft it in a way that sounds fluid. You know, and you watch someone like, like a, um, I mean, the easiest, most pop pop culture example is like a Louis C.K. When you watch him, uh, a, a special of his, and you're like, man, it's he's just telling a story. It's so natural, and it's just like, god damn, that's fucking so hard. You know. Mm-hmm. And like it just looks so easy and natural, and that's why you like him because he's like he's just a, he's just good at it. It's like fuck no, dude, it took decades to do that, you know, yep. to say something that simply. And when you talk to or when you listen to good stand-ups, really well crafted stand-up comedians talk about the craft of their medium, and they talk. They have this saying called uh, uh, "playing to the back of the room," right? Where you're 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 on stage at a, a little shitty comedy club and there's the audience you know and then there's the bar in the back of the room and uh who's standing around that bar are the other comedians mm. and if you can make them laugh fuck the audience like they might not be laughing but if those guys around the bar are laughing like you know you're on the right track yeah right? Hell yeah and that and that some at some point the rest of the audience will catch up and they'll laugh too um and that was also something that um, would, like I said, back in in my Miami days, working with that glass artist in at the university, the professor, is that um, he had this body of work that was super successful, right? And he was adamant about changing his work. You know, he he never just made the same thing over and over again. He always would move on. And at a certain point, the work we were making wasn't necessarily as successful as that earlier work. But I asked him, I was like, why don't you just go back and like, you know, make a couple of those pieces or in, the, in a different way or something? Because people still want them, you know, and he kind of looked at me uh, and like he says, uh, you know what? Sometimes you got to have the balls to do what you know is right and let everybody else fucking catch up. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that's starting to happen with my work. And a lot of it is because people like you, you like realize like some of these things that look pretty simple are actually really fucking mind bending and hard even to glass blowers you know mm-hmm. yeah but, but once you you know you'll figure it out how i did it and be like oh i see that you know yep, and absolutely. hopefully it'll inspire you in a way to do something similar um, in a different way yeah well you know like when you talk about this the classes i i'm self-taught myself like i, I had a real basic mm-hmm. apprenticeship when i started i met a guy at the renaissance festival and i did like six months of shopkeep sweeping floors and what have you and then i did six months of torch work and it was all beads and pendants but i got a really strong technical foundation on shop setup and safety and the equipment itself like i was always taught that your torch should be just as easy to use as a screwdriver when you understand the properties of how it works right you know kind of idea and uh but i I took my first class last year and it was with coil and steve sizelove and and with those two guys together it was the first time they actually had worked together in person they guess they'd done mail collapse and stuff but they started off the class with what do you guys want to learn? And I had, and I was like 10 minutes late to the class. I drove like six hours to get to there. Right. And, uh, so I missed like giving an input what I, what I wanted to learn, but everybody that mentioned something was something I wanted. But these two guys sat there and they went over our shit and they were fully communicated between all of us. It was a, it was more of a visual class. It wasn't actually hands on. Yeah. But the amount of, the amount of confidence it gave me in my work that was, I was already doing was huge. But also the right. amount of stuff that I learned just how to fine tune or just seeing like a, a move that they would do that I thought was way complicated was something that I was already doing, but I hadn't implemented it necessarily that way yet. Right. And that yeah. really changed everything for me. Like I came home and it was like I, I had to like throw all my shit away and start over kind of thing. It cleaned it all up, you know, tremendously. Yeah. You know, it, and it was neat. And then, oh, yeah. And then, but then I started I started really paying attention to art, th- that type of artist like like yourself and then i came across your bottle with the gecko or the chameleon skeleton inside of that yeah how how the fuck did you guys do that was that a lathe piece (laughs) yeah 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 okay yeah Yeah. and still like i we none of us had ever done that before and there was like communication like problem too yeah totally i I mean i yeah i get that yeah that was hilarious so much fun with those guys like that and that was one of my favorite pieces and it actually just sold which I was bummed about because I was about to pay those guys out and keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I was really like like a week away from making that move of going like, I got I made a little bit of money. I think I can talk them into letting me have this. Um, and so, but anyway, um, but yeah, like, um, and a lot of it's just like throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks, you know, mm-hmm. 
and having it and it's great what a what the the language of glass goes a lot further than you know a spoken language sometimes where it was like them just pointing and you know they spoke pretty good english too but when it comes down to when shit hits the fan the <laughs> You know, we're all missing some skills of communication, but the glass skills and just being able to like, you know, and get get things going. That was that was a cool piece. Yeah, it was, it was. huge too. Oh, really? How big was it? Um, 110 millimeters in diameter. That, Holy that shit! That shooting is 100, 110 millimeter, and it stood probably about 20 inches tall. Wow. Yeah. Holy yeah, shit! I, actually, let me. <laughs> I got a I got a ruler me. right here. Um. <laughs> That makes it even more because because when you look at the picture of it, it's like the, I mean the photography that was done was so well done on that you know by the yeah. way. So it's it's always hard to gauge size when you see pictures. Yeah, actually, it may have been like more like twenty six inches tall. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. Um, it was cool, cool, cool piece though. Love that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Huh. But um. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's where like your technical side for me is like really when I started. Like I've I've always enjoyed your work. Like for instance, like your caterpillars you were doing. What the hell influenced that? Oh, that was working for this woman in Miami. That the, the other uh, the ceramics professor, you know, and that um, it's a whole part of that story I left out. But that was another real good window into the fine art world. Was that she was making this work and she needed some glass little glass parts that I, I helped her make. They're very simple little glass pomegranate seeds. And then eventually she got an opportunity to, to work with a bigger gallery and make a little more work a little crazier. So I started making more elaborate stuff for her. And, and eventually her work looked like um, kind of bone and muscle and plant life. And her name was Bonnie Seaman. Um, and uh, so she asked for some insects and so I started making these little insects and different insects and I was making spiders for her and figured out a way to kind of make the, the, uh, what would it call the thorax or the, 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 the big, big booty on like a, a like a black widow, you know, mm-hmm. like how to make this interesting pattern. And in that pattern I was making, I realized it looked just like a segmented caterpillar before I melted it in. And then, boom, next thing I know, I was making these caterpillars. They're probably still the coolest things I make. Um, but they're fucking explosive. You know, that's one of those things where they're just a bunch of really bad seals stacked on top of compounding on each other um, to the point where it's it's a beautiful object, but not necessarily well made as far as what borosilicate can handle, you know, mm-hmm. stability-wise. Yeah, but there's certain fun. sacrifices you make to make something cool sometimes, you know? Yeah, I, I know what you mean, man. Because, like, uh, at Disney, I'd make Olaf, the little snowman from Frozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's, a, it's an awesome opportunity. I'm the only one in the world making them, you know, which is fucking super cool. But I do them instead. I may use Chinese white to make them with. Yeah. And it took me probably, I would say probably about two weeks of just playing with that glass to yeah. just figure out that glass, you know, and then oh, yeah. and th- then to have to sculpt it and then add it and and beat the shit out of it, and then be able to put it into production to where like I'm, I need to make like maybe like one and a half an hour in a sense to make it worth my time, you know. But it's fun to take borosilicate and push it as far as you can push it to where the shit just doesn't want to work anymore. Yeah, and then you push it a little bit further. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, they learn so much that way. Yeah, so. totally, man. Because like, like, like the caterpillars are doing. I mean, they're freaking awesome. If you don't mind, how much were you selling those for? The retail on those? It's so funny because they started out as uh, uh, fifty bucks retail, you know, mm-hmm. and now they're up to uh, like almost four hundred, you oh, know. Yeah. yeah. And that's still not even giving me the money relative to the time I put in them. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I typically only make them. Like, and just, it, I make a batch and most of them are for gifts, you know, like mm-hmm. I'll give them away. I, I'm actually happier giving them away to people that, uh, that I'm close to, or, uh, than selling them because it's so, such a shitty equation of like, I do, those are a passion project where I think they're cool as shit. Um, but it's like, you know, it's really hard to get the money I need for them. They take so long oh, the I way I like imagine. to make them. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're beautiful. And the pain in the ass factor is a motherfucker. Dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just getting those legs on there is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, man, seeing, seeing, oh, man, just like some of the details out there that are being created in bugs and stuff, it's, it's mind yeah. blowing. Yeah. And mind yeah, bending. That's for sure. I don't get it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, so before I take up too much of your time, let's go ahead and take a minute to thank our sponsors, and then we'll get back, and it'll be time for us to crash the kiln. Sounds good. All right, man. 
Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash wiseguyradio. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's at www.audibletrial.com, A-U-D-I-B-L-E-T-R-I-A-L.com forward slash wiseguyradio. Kiln round it consists of around six questions, and if you can give me a 30 to 6 second answer, and if you want to expound upon them as well, you can too, which typically happens. And uh, the first question I always like to ask is if you could work with any living glass artist that you haven't worked with yet, who is it and why? Oh, crap. Um, hmm, I guess shit. Man, that's a rough one. Mm. Any living glass artist and why? Um, how about... Man, gotta narrow that down. I'm just gonna go with the easy one um, because it's always been true. But banjo, hell yeah. Uh, and I think why is because we we share a similar engineering mind, you know, um, and that um, uh, I've always just appreciated his uh, just the 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 balls he has to make these large projects, right? You know, mm-hmm. and it's something you don't in in mind investing a shit ton of time. And at any moment, it come crashing down. And that's what I've done with kind of some sewing machines and stuff in the past. So, like those big projects. And I think we, we the problem is, is I think that we would probably start a project that was way too big because neither <laughs> of us are scared of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like his R2 that he first, that, that big R2 he made, I was like, yeah. How big is that thing? I mean, really? What the yeah. fuck? Yeah, Holy yeah. Jesus. No, it would be a shitty game of chicken where neither of us were like, oh, yeah, well, we could do that too. Oh, yeah, well, we could do that too. <laughs> and it's, next thing you know, we'd be like, ah, oh, Christ, we got to do this thing. Now. Yeah, you guys would call Marcel, like, hey, guys, I, I need a kiln to yeah, put yeah. this thing in. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what, are your, uh, what are your top five favorite colors in glass? Um, let's see. Um, Cymax Clear. Um, Kev- let's see. Uh, um, Bore Autistic Clear. How many different types of clear are there? <laughs> um, no. Uh, <laughs> hey, clear's a color. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, actually, that's the clear is my favorite color. So, I mean, I think that uh, clear, number one, you get to play with a fucking force field. How cool is that? It's mm-hmm. the coolest thing that nobody pays attention to. Oh, yeah. Playing with fucking nothing. It's so awesome. It's yep. the one thing in glass that's so unique to glass. Especially um, when you're in the sun. Yeah. Uh, so, there's clear. There's... Um, my favorite color combo ever was the first one I did in uh, in the 99, not first one, the first one I fell in love with, which was Turbo Cobalt over OG Moss, man. Mm. And uh, it's just not around anymore. But um, uh, so, and then, let's see, that's three, and then a black, jet black, love it. Um, and let's see, uh, what other color is there? <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, th- that's the problem with a guy that doesn't use a lot of color, mm-hmm. you know, is that uh, you hit the wall. Um, uh, oh, easy, North Star Yellow, NS09. Yeah, I love that color. That's actually my top is is North Star Yellow. Hell yeah. Yeah. So uh, what's your worst injury in the studio? Um, this may take a little more than uh, a minute to tell, hey, that's uh, fine. but you're going to love it. I'll make it quick. So um, I just got my GTT. In like 2001, 2002, I got a Delta, and I had that cool ass, cool needle flame that you can get on a brand new GTT that is just fucking amazing. And um, somehow I dropped something and reached for it and put my finger right through that just needle sharp flame, smallest flame. But what it did is it it kind of on my pointer finger it stretched it went um, from kind of the side of one fingernail barely hit the fingernail. And then kind of wrapped around my down the whole finger, but kind of wrapped around the whole thing, you know, like this is like you, uh, yeah, you drew a kind of a spiral from one side of your fingernail on the outside and it spiraled all the way to the kind of webbing on in between your first and second finger. Right. So I drew this line with this torch and then. What had happened is my mother was a is a nurse. I called her. I was like, this was a bad one. I, I rarely call my mom for medical advice. But this one, I was like, okay, uh, I don't know. Should I be going to the hospital? What's going on? She's like, well, here's the deal. Um, it was a day or two later. She said, it started to blister. She was like, just, you know, keep it clean and let that blister go for as long as possible. You know, that blister is just, it's it's healing. It's what the body does. Try not to pop it and let, let the body do its thing. 
you, what you don't want to do is get infected, you know, and all this stuff. So she's like, let the blister go for as long as possible. Keep me updated and see. So what happened is this blister developed that was just enormous. It's probably as tall as my finger, but it was like a, it was like a banana slug wrapping around my finger, right? Cool. And so I had splinted this thing. It was on my right hand. I splinted it with a, um, you know, so it wouldn't bend. It couldn't bend anyway. Yeah. Um, and then just wrapped it and kept it that way for a couple of weeks. And this thing was just building and building and building pressure. And uh, eventually it's just been wrapped for so long. I'm in Florida. It's humid as shit. It's just my finger is just, you know, it's like I've been swimming for two weeks straight. It's just, you know, wrinkled and just <laughs> like it's, this thing needs some air, right? And so I unwrap it and uh, given it air, it feels great. And it's not hurting anymore. The blister is just like, you know, just like a water balloon. And um, so I'm, I'm driving around town running some errands. I go to the bank and make a deposit. And I, I uh, hand her my check and the, the deposit slip. Um, and she looks at me. She's just like, oh, shoot, here, you forgot to endorse your check. So she slides back to check to me, hands me a pen. Without thinking, I grab the pen and squeeze and this blister lets go, oh. and it shoots this this amazing, like, arcing money shot of blister juice, like, straight at her, um, and then hits her. There's a trail leading from my finger to her, to up her shirt, over her shoulder, and to the wall behind her. Oh, my God. Now, the beautiful part is she is doing that thing where at the bank where they, you know, she has like quit looking at me and she's now looking at the computer and typing in all the information. <laughs> she hasn't seen any of this. And so I slide her my check and on the way back, I drag my arm and wipe that trail of fucking blister juice back to me. And I'm just just sit there waiting, you know. And she hands me all my information and I fucking get out of there because I'm pretty sure I just assaulted this woman. Like, I don't. And then that was it. That's my worst injury. Yeah. Oh, God, that's so fucking gross. Oh, it's horrible. Like, it is just uh, it's like the grossest story and probably one of the best ones I got. Oh, as far as man, injuries that's go. awesome. It's yeah. a, it's amazing, though, dude, because I've, I've hit my hand in the flame twice in 17 years and both times. Yeah. hurt like a motherfucker. And like you're saying, the blister you get is incredible how yeah. gross it is. I mean, like it's, but you know, it's what's amazing with the with the burns we get from the glass is it's such an intense, amazingly quick heat, but the core of that burn it's so deep, you know. Yeah. It's oh, like yeah. you know, like, it, and, and that what I've found is, which anybody listening to this should take, is that when you do burn yourself, you should try to cool it down as quick as you can because the core is still hot. You might yeah. cool the surface down, but the in, internally, your skin's still burning. Yeah, you know, because I had I had an issue where I did the, I, I you know they say lavender is like one of the good things for a burn because it takes away the pain and shit naturally, but you got to have a a completely cool everything because otherwise it turns into like a fucking grease fire, and I put oh, yeah. I put lavender on a fresh on a fresh heat dude I do not recommend it to anybody it's I still have Horrible. a scar from it yeah yeah ugh never thought of that oh yeah. god yeah ugh yeah no <laughs> yep all right so on with that. <laughs> so, uh, awesome. So in the studio, uh, do you watch TV, listen to the radio, or do you do both? Um, I'm a freaking audio podcast, audiobook addict. You know, if I'm not, you know, listening to eight hours of podcasts in a row, I'm, I'm, you know, audiobooks. I'll go through like three audiobooks a week. You know, um, so that's that's it, man. It's just constant information if I can get it. Um, a lot of times, even the podcasts aren't that super nerdy a lot of them are just entertaining mm -hmm. um just to keep my mind occupied but um i'm a big like you know i love science i love anything i love to learn while i'm working um because i work so much doesn't give me a lot of time to read and research as much as i'd like so anything i can get while i'm working is is good to me yeah i'm in the same boat do you have any favorite podcasts besides mine <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> and yours um uh yeah right uh so yeah, my love for podcasts is is, is like and now I'm kind of trying to do one as well. Um, um, so let's see. Uh, Hardcore History, amazing. I've heard that. I, yeah, I haven't listened uh, to it yet. Yeah, you'll love it. Start with the the Wrath of the Cons, and yeah. you'll be hooked. That's what um, I heard. and it's like a six part or five parts anyway. Um, and then th then another history one, which is on the comedic end, which I think is great, is the Dollop. Okay. And uh, you'll love that. Uh, too, uh, and that's about an hour or two or a half hour. But um, the hardcore history gets up to three hours. They're more like audiobooks. You'll love it. Nice. Have you gotten into uh, serial or any of those yet? 
Yeah, you know, in serial, um, you know, I'm a kind of a fundamentalist podcast guy. I'm not as much interested in just a radio show that now decides that they're a podcast. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Which is what I feel that serial is. It's like you're just way overproduced, <clears> and <throat> um, which is nothing wrong with that. They're still really amazing. Mm-hmm. As far as podcasts go, I'm much more the kind of guy that just wants just a, a pretty open-ended uh, long-form interviews or um it's like the the cool part about podcasts is I feel like is it's not broadcasting, it's narrow casting where Correct. you can where you can tap into something that you're specifically interested in and it's not just meant for the masses. You can tap into that one dude in Sheboygan, Wisconsin that happens to be nerdy about the same thing you are and maybe there's only 500 followers, but you can get some cool, you know, interaction like that. I love that shit. So. Yeah, that's why I thought it was cool when I when I started this myself before you guys got into the landscape that I was like the only like live podcast right now that was in this space of glass. I, I, you know? I was so embarrassed that as many podcasts as I listened to, I hadn't figured out you were doing this yet. Cause like as soon as I did, I was like, damn it. I have, which is great. Cause now I binge podcasts. So I have so much to catch up on. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. That you're going to be 86. So, uh, sweet. Yeah. Which is fucking crazy. 86 episodes. Like I, <laughs> I, I sat back the other day and I was thinking like, I mean, literally bro, I was spending 30 hours a week on this on the show doing three episodes yeah. a week and it took away i mean a financial but thank god my wife was helping pay the bills because like my savings got down i mean everything because i had just opened <sighs> up the studio you know like and i wasn't yeah. getting paid for it and that you know my mountain glasses on now as a sponsor which is killer great which yeah, helps awesome. but you know yeah. it's it's because i do love this format and it's you know to be a part of it and also because i love our industry and to have the, the ability to help I, I didn't care that I wasn't making any money, that I was de- that, that I was dedicating 30 hours, that I was up on the couch at 3 in the morning waking up with my headphones on my head because I was yeah. falling asleep during my post-production, <laughs> you know, after doing a whole day in the studio. It is not, it is not easy, right? No, you no, know? uh-uh. Yeah. Not I, um, well, I want to give also, just because they are, Mountain Glass is one of your sponsors, I'll give them a little freebie because, like, they were my go-to guys in in North Carolina. Like, they lived within an dri- hour drive of me. And I've never dealt with a better company. It's awesome. Yeah, I love fantastic. those guys. Yeah, yeah, knowledgeable. The whole nine yards, like just incredible. Oh, the customer service is out of this fucking world, and that's the big difference between everybody else I've dealt with. Yeah, yeah, so. you might, yeah exactly. And, and without naming names, but my new favorite thing they're doing, man, is if when you order from them, they get little cards and they come with it, with a little drawing on there that says who who packed yeah. your stuff for you. You know. Oh, so, everybody that works there is awesome. They're yeah, such good guys. Yeah, like it's all killer. The, yeah, even the packing and shipping guys are just like friendliest. I loved going there. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, one more thing. Have you listened to Tim Ferriss? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Love it. Cool. I figured yep. as much. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, let me see where we at now. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. So I guess we kind of gone through them. Oh yeah. Uh, if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, what is it? Shit. <laughs> that was it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah, man. So my last and final question, uh, if you were stranded on an island, and this could be any island that you want it to be, whether it's a resort, deserted, what have you, and uh-huh. they had a glass studio that you had to work in, and they supplied your gases, a kiln, and your torch, what five items would you bring? So your gases, your kiln, and your torch. Mm-hmm. Glass. Mm-hmm. Clear. Um, and... Uh, Glasses. Oh, there you go. Um, and uh, a reamer. That's it. That's all you need? You got two more? No. I mean, so I don't work with a lot of tools. If you ever take a class from me, you'll, you'll notice it's like all I, I use glass as a tool most of the time. So yeah, I typically uh, use a reamer <clears throat> as far as, and, uh, and um, that's about it. Um, tweezers. I'll bring tweezers too. Okay. Just because. Yeah. There you go. Sweet. You're the first person that's only needed four things. And also one of the few that have mentioned glasses. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. I did cheat, dude. I've listened to your shit before. Good. You're like, oh, what about glasses? I'm like, okay, <laughs> if I'm ever on this, I know I'm going to, like, don't forget the glasses. Uh, good. Yeah. You're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that smart, dude. I, I had to do some research. <laughs> awesome, dude. So before we let you go, if you want to uh, give us some parting piece of advice to the glass artists out there listening to this and those also that are not glass artists, and then uh, after that, if you want to give us a way where we can find you out there in cyberspace. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess my my piece of advice to glass artists is uh, don't be afraid to uh, turn them down the money and invest in yourself. Um, take those opportunities that, like I did in Miami to work for other artists and learn 
um, just because you aren't getting paid for it doesn't mean you aren't making progress. So um, no lateral moves. As long as it's a move forward and you're learning stuff, don't worry about the money. Take those sacrifices and, and gather that knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, let's see. My Instagram uh, is Micah Glass. Um, I'm about to ditch Facebook. Really, I'm done with that shit, so yeah, don't too. even bother. Yeah, Micah Glass, uh, I think uh, you can find me on uh, – um, uh, I'm just starting to uh, up on Snapchat. Just search my name. I'll come up. Um, and then uh, uh, the studio I'm involved with now, you know, if you don't mind me promoting no, or do, doing a shameless yep. promo on the – we're starting uh, a little podcast as well, and um, which is cool is that I believe, it's funny that we're not uh, – I don't think we're, you and I, we were in competitions. Like we're kind of doing different things, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I'm couldn't be more excited because of the podcast addict. I am, uh, to try that out, but it's called torch time. We're just getting off the ground and we are way, we have our shit way less put together than you do. So (laughs) if you do listen, just uh, be patient. We're going to be going through some growing pains and, um, but please give us a listen. We'd love any input and, um, Thank you so much. We got to have you once we get going and we can we can do you a service. So we'd love to have you on our podcast. Um, yeah, man. Be because, an honor. Yeah, that would be amazing. Well, maybe we're going to try to we've talked about this, maybe get you down to Austin and uh, get some work done and um, have some fun and, and get you on the podcast. That way it would be great, man. If I can come play with you all, dude, I'd have a boner the entire time. That would be great. man. Yeah. Let's do that. I have to get cool. a Kevlar wrap just for that. So I don't burn myself. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Also, hey, real, real quick, while we got you, on the, I'm talking about your podcast. What's what's your guys' mission? Like, what's the what's the goal perspective of what you guys want to do? So, you know, it's funny. Um, we are uh, just kind of giving a so it's 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 Salt, uh, Lucan, and I, who uh, we have we we have these great conversations between us, and we're we're kind of uh, it, it, he he and uh, David Daly of uh of grav labs kind of started this without me and not knowing that not not without me but not knowing of how into um podcasting i was you know and i think their their philosophy was just kind of uh you know giving a perspective to um people that may not be uh in the industry of kind of what's going on um and then uh i i myself am much more interested in kind of the story um, and so, uh, and that, uh, in fact, these guys actually have a more clear idea of what they're going for. And mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting to see if that aligns with, with what I love as well. Right now I'm excited to be involved in something I've always loved, but, um, you know, I think our philosophy is, is to kind of, uh, give a little bit of what you do, a little bit of history to the, the artists and makers and a little bit of perspective to the collectors and um, non-collectors and to what is going on, kind of the state of the industry as it progresses, you know, and I'm sure uh, our podcast will evolve into its own thing, um, a, a clearer philosophy as we figure out what our strengths as interviewers are, mm-hmm. you know, I think a lot of it is is like you go into these things thinking like, oh, I love these things, I can do, let's do that, and then you realize like, just like glass, you're like, oh, I can't wait to try that, and then you try it, and you're like, holy shit, this is really hard, yeah. And this is a whole skill set, and we have to learn a lot. So there's gonna be a lot of learning and a lot of growing pains, just like in glass blowing, as we learn kind of how to navigate this this uh, podcast as we go. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah. Well, up yeah. here, I want to give you guys, like I said, got some pointers for you. Yeah, please, we'd love any input. <clears throat> Thank you so much. For yeah. sure. Hell yeah, man. Well, again, it's been an honor to have you on, and definitely y'all go check him out. Uh, MicahEvans.com as well. You can find his website. And, yes. And uh, other than that, brother, thank you so much for coming on board, and I uh, hope you all enjoy this conversation. And definitely, if you can get in yourself involved in education outside of your studio, whoever it's from, I shouldn't say whoever because it makes a difference who you learn from, but definitely take some classes. Yes. Because you don't yes, know everything. Definitely. So. <laughs> Yeah, amen, brother. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Hell yeah, man. We all enjoy the show. We'll talk to you in a bit. Peace. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. If you have any questions, comments, or remarks, please leave them in the show notes page area where it says comments. We'll see you soon. Have a wise night.